Hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see so many people sitting in the auditorium. And I would love to warmly welcome you in Zelin and welcome you to the Street Conference 2019. Thank you, thank you to all speakers and delegates for taking your precious time to come to our conference and to share your valuable experiences and your insights and, um, and discuss with us the future of the landscape architecture. We especially welcome you in Zelin, the city where MMCT was born and the city that is very special for Czech, Czech Republic um, uh, environment because Zlín is a very unique city with its architecture. You can see everywhere the red brick and the uh, Tomáš Baťa management and um, Tom Tomáš Baťa visions are being seen everywhere on the streets. And I think it's quite a special place to hold an urbanism conference like ours. The urban fabric of Zlín is infused by visions of the urban utopia, visions that are embedded in the various concepts of the value. We can see the value from the social, from the economical, from the environmental, but also political point of view. And this is the theme for our conference, the value of the public space. The value of the public space is frequently discussed, but quite often it's quite poorly understood. Very typically, we see the value in its economic terms as a commodity, commodity where it's input and its maintenance and its cost needs to be justified by, um, by, 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 the, by the initial um, expenditure. Land is considered as real estate matter and the privatization imposes corporate rules on who might be using and who is allowed to use the space. In my opinion, this divides people. This leads to gentrification in some of the projects that we see all over the world. But it's not the well-designed public space that divides people. It is our understanding of what the value is and what affects it. Viewing public space only as an economic term might make it as a, as a too close view on what the social networking needs to be created. When a space is valued by people, then we can embed the future of the local communities and we can, we can secure the sustainability and the safety of our streets. By widening our view of what the value of public space might be, then that's the physical asset which can bring people together. We can create inspiring cities and vibrant public realms. When we talk about the public space, perhaps we should be asking a different question, not what is the value of the public space, but what it is that we value about our public realms. If streets are the face of the city, then they communicate its character to its values. What do our streets say about our cultures and our cities that we live in is also the face of our communities. I'm not going to take it any much longer. I believe that we all understand what the value of the, of, of the public space is. We can be talking about the, the, the benefits that it brings to mental health, the physical health, uh, the way that our work, landscape architecture, can bring um, uh, less cars to the streets, uh, lowering the, the, the pollution, uh, tackling the droughts all over the world, which we in Czech Republic are currently experiencing. And I think this is exactly what we're trying to, what, what we're bringing to this, to this conference, that we invited an um, amazing number of speakers that are, that are here today with us. Taking the view of the value that is both wide and long can create urban spaces that, that, it, the, the decades, decades that will come will show us, the designers, the architects, the users, the investors, that these, these spaces are very precious to us. Our program of speakers today represents the wide and long view. We are honored to be joined by speakers from across the globe whose value perspectives on urban range, from its governance to its design, from its strategic visions to the artful detail. I personally am very excited to have you all here and to hear the amazing presentations. I'm excited to, 
discuss the, the theme of the value of the public space with you throughout the day and in the evening, which is promising to be full of dancing and hopefully some nice food. And I hope you, as our, our delegates, you will reflect on the conference theme in its widest range. And please remember that public space without people is just a space. It doesn't have any value. And if you design for people, then the rewards will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, the toilets are right behind me. Toiletti, right behind me. And if your phone rings, you have to put it on speaker so we can listen in also to the conversation, okay? Um, so I'm Jerry, Jerry Van Eyck. Um, I'm a designer. Uh, my company is called Melk. Um, and we are a, uh, a forum for landscape architecture and, uh, and urban design. Um, we have a global portfolio of projects. Currently, we are active in uh, five continents. Our projects range from uh, urban design, urban designs to public realm master plans, parks, public spaces, both for private and public clients, and, and, and waterfronts. Um, as far as I know, there's no pink dot in Czech Republic yet, but who knows, that could come. Um, so some of our projects um, behind me, and um, you know, uh, if, if you look at those projects, uh, we can, ourselves, we can always uh, uh, um, conclude that they, they are always uniquely tailored to, to the context. Um, uh, and with our projects, we always try to enhance or create identity for a place, a place with, uh, that is attractive and, and, and has an allure. Uh, besides that, our projects are about, are about sustainability, uh, not just eco uh, ecological su su sustainability, but also economic sustainability and cultural sustainability. Uh, let me see, we can talk about any of these projects. Uh, uh, we're currently doing an um, a urban park in Cairo in Egypt. Um, we're doing a two kilometers long pedestrian boulevard in Dubai. Actually with uh, a local company, and one of the speakers is uh, representing that company uh, later. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about that, let's leave it to him. Uh, we're currently working on a park in New York at a former uh, shipping um, uh, terminal pier uh, along the Hudson River. And oh, and uh, we are also uh, recently became the master plan landscape architect for John F. Kennedy uh, airport, uh, which is also a nice job. Um, but, you know, all together uh, and, and constantly coming up with projects that are unique, um, all, all unique uh, in, in terms of identity, there's only one key word that we try to, let's say, um, make ourselves, which is agility, right? Being agile as a designer. And I think I'm not speaking just for myself, but for all designers here in the room. So every time, starting from scratch, using no formula for design, but every time trying to understand and assess each situation fully uh, um, again and again, knowing nothing. Then come up with solutions for people to adopt and to make it their own. Right? That's what we do. And that's, we, you can see in all of our uh, projects, um, hopefully. So actually I was thinking of do, is there a, a spirit animal or a spirit figure, you know, that we can ident identify ourselves with as, uh, as designers? And, you know, the closest I could get is with this guy. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, some of you remember uh, this character out of Pulp Fiction, um, which is now this year 25 years old, Pulp Fiction, believe it or not. So this is Winston Wolf and he shows up to solve problems, right? So this, this is kind of what we do, right? Um, you know, assess a situation, come up with a very simple solution that are, is completely uh, uh, self, 
evident. And actually, this character became, you know, adopted in the uh, Urban Dictionary. So you can be a Winston Wolf, right? So it's a person who solves problems. Lucid thinking, stylish charisma, yeah? <laughs> and, you know, galvanizing other people into action. Or, if you're not familiar with this guy, I'm sure, you know, you can identify as this, you know, because that, this is what you really have to be, to be a designer. So we are sponge, right? And, you know, that's just, you know, uh, to understand the situation, to, to basically learn uh, about everything. So there's the client brief. You have to, like, absorb that. You have to understand local politics, absorb it. Collaboration protocols with, you know, we, we're not alone. We always collaborated with engineers, other architects, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, specialists, you know, that becomes part of the process. We have to understand the history of place, you know, all going into here or here or wherever. Yeah? Uh, understanding local uh, culture, codes and guidelines, the boring puzzle, um, you know, uh, listening to people's opinions uh, of a place or, uh, you know, the demands of a community, that all goes in that sponge. Listening to anecdotes, you know, uh, what, what do people have to say? How is the project alive um, with, with the community? We have to understand labor standards. I, since eight years work in the US, labor is very bad, you know? We have to, like, deal with that, uh, that situation. Um, economic opportunities, understanding that we create amenities that basically enhance, um, you know, e economic opportunity. It's a mechanism uh, for economics. We have to understand that too and how. Um, sustainability and resiliency goals, of course, uh, including climate. And basically, you know, get to the essence of place, yeah? So that all goes into our heads. And then the design is basically, so the creative process is basically squeezing out the sponge, right? People always want to know what the creative process is, but it's, it's really squeezing out the sponge. And, you know, I think you can, uh, the designers can relate to that. So if I go, like, more accurate in portraying ourselves, or me at least, you know, it's this Winston Wolf sponge guy, right? And, and we're here to solve problems, yeah? So, um, just for example, right, so um, uh, a couple of projects, and I hope, you know, you can see kind of what, we, what, we do, what we're doing there. Las Vegas, um, the Las Vegas Strip, I'm sure you're familiar with it. This is an old image of Las Vegas Strip when uh, the Strip was originally a highway uh, in the desert. And it was basically meant to go by car, you know, the American dream, uh, from property to property, right? And with all, you know, the desert experience. Um, today, however, the tr this, that same strip, it's about two kilometers long, is completely saturated with that crazy stuff, right? Saturated with casinos, hotels, and not just that, the Las Vegas Strip is also the most visited tourist destination in the world. Uh, for 43 million visitors they had last year, or more even. So it's a, it's a, it's a serious, um, you know, uh, a space where people gather uh, year round. And you don't go from property to property by car anymore because simply there's, there's no room anymore. Um, in fact, people are all pedestrian, right? People like walk from property to property on their flip-flops in the scorching heat. There's nothing to do until a couple of years ago. Uh, we were approached to make a master plan for the strip, you know, uh, focused on the pedestrian uh, experience, basically activating that space that uh, initially was not designed for pedestrians, but just, you know, to be seen from, uh, from the car. So, you know, skipping the whole uh, sponge situation, uh, a number of years ago, we realized this, this stretch in front of like a few of the major uh, properties there. And you can see that, you know, it became a, a real uh, pedestrian boulevard with authentic uh, 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 use of materials such as native vegetation to create shade and not like fake, 
you know, palm trees and that kind of stuff. But actual material, we kind of refer to the, uh, uh, the context of the desert with, you know, desert colors, desert, uh, desert patterns, if you will. And uh, today, the strip experience is a, is a lot more pleasant than it used to be, including, um, you know, sidewalk cafes and restaurants and bars and shops and stuff like that, including a lot of integrated uh, uh, furniture uh, that we designed custom um, and also, you know, movable uh, furniture just, you know, to create like a very pleasant, um, you know, public uh, destination, public feel. Most significant uh, intervention, though, was um, in between two major properties. Our client, which is the owner of most properties along the Strip, MGM Resorts International. Um, maybe I should stand on this side, right, so you can, guys can see. Um, decided um, not to build another casino, which could have easily placed, be placed and, and located at that location, but a park, a public park. So they decided to invest in a space, in a void, in an urban void, a park, to, um, to enhance basically the value of the adjacent properties. Right? They understood that that's important uh, you know, to basically um, uh, deal with that pedestrian uh, uh, traffic. So um, we designed the first public park ever along the Las Vegas Strip. Yeah? And the Strip being the most visited destination in the world, you can only imagine that while this park is inter interwoven in the traffic, you know, that is be, you know, quite significantly traffic park, right? And we took inspiration from what Fe Vegas once was, which was an oasis in the desert, right? It's not, it wasn't uh, like a fake plastic Disney uh, place. It was like, there was water coming out of the ground. There was like shade and mesquite trees. And we basically used that exact palette in the creation, creation of, for the first time, something authentic along the strip something that's dedicated to history and context, the first park uh, along Las Vegas Boulevard, which is dealing with large surges of people in the evening. But, you know, in the morning, there's like quiet, intimate spaces to contemplate the sins uh, that you committed like the previous night, um, or read a book or drink a coffee, right? So um, we, 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 we applied a lot of custom uh, elements uh, for example, uh, we, uh, we made this planter edges out of a local material, only can be found there in the ground. And, you know, we used a CNC uh, uh, software to com uh, communicate directly with the machines of the fabricator uh, to, to, to create those, uh, those planter uh, walls, for example. Um, also, it's very hot in Las Vegas. Who, who has ever been in Vegas? Anyone? Ah. I would say 10% 10, 10 of, <laughs> of people here. Um, and so it's, it's super hot, I can promise you, very hot. Uh, so we created also a, uh, yeah, everything about microclimate, double water wall in, in between the, wa the two water walls, the temperature is about 15 degrees lower, um, 15 centigrades lower than outside of the water wall. And of course, water was a great photo opportunity, right? Um, during the night, uh, it's, it's a major feature that guides you into the park. And, in, and, and finally, you know, that pink uh, uh, luminescent uh, element there is what we designed as a shade structure. So because desert trees are quite low, we designed, let's say, artificial trees, which are double the height of the desert trees to create even more uh, uh, shade, right? We fully engineered it out of double curved uh, two and a half centimeters thick steel plates, um, you know, produced by uh, sh the uh, shipping industry. And um, here you see uh, those elements. It's, it's based on like uh, able to fit in a 40 foot shipping container. And here you see the, um, the, 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 the erection of the, of, the, of the shade structures. And just for reference, in terms of scale, these things are like 25 meters high. All right, so this gives you an idea how tall these uh, elements are. And we have four clusters uh, spread through uh, uh, the park. So they don't le look heavy, but it's 500 metric tons of artificial trees, let's say, uh, establishing a uh, verticality and microclimate 
uh, in the park, you know, very nice tree-like uh, uh, shade that's being cast on places where you sit. And during the night, as you already saw, they, they're beautifully lit and, you know, creating uh, a spectacular dimension uh, to, to this park in uh, the very first park, uh, privately owned public park in, in, in Las Vegas. And what was uh, uh, something that we learned from this project was basically, you know, best um, illustrated with it that on the on the on the uniforms of the park police, they represented, um, you know, the iconic shade structures as the logo of the park. Yeah. So, public space, besides being an amenity, also is a Im Im very important branding tool. A uh, marketable branding tool for uh, owners or cities or governments of, of spaces and parts of the city. Um, another example here, Shanghai, uh, China. And this project is all about sustainability, about ecologic and economic uh, sustainability. So um, we uh, won an international com uh, design competition and at a historic site, uh, in, in Shanghai, downtown Shanghai, along the Suzhou Creek, which is like also nicknamed the Mother Creek. So everything started here in, uh, in Shanghai. From here, the, the city grew into a, uh, you know, into, into a modern metropole, right? Uh, uh, at a location that was zoned as a park, but on top of an underground shopping mall. In China, everything is shopping malls. Um, you know, we, we had to deal with this, basically, this, this contradiction. Creating a park, uh, an area that was zoned as a park, on top of a shopping mall. So, this is the site, um, like a year ago or so. They're now excavating the, uh, the shopping mall, so it's under construction right now. And here you see our designed, um, you know, superimposed uh, and montaged in the, in, into, that, in the, into the drone shot. And I'll explain the... Uh, the design to you. So this is our um, schematic design. This is where we kind of uh, left it recently. Um, the design is based on two things: circulation. So it's pure, purely a logical uh, layout, right? It's based on circulation, as well as on water management. Yeah, here is where the ecological element comes in. So water management. So. There, in China, there's a green plot ratio requirements, which means that for every new building location, there's a certain percentage, in this case, 70%, that has to be green, meaning water, rainwater, needs to be absorbed into the ground. That's a law, right? So, so of course, if there's a, uh, if this is a full soil site, uh, everything in the park gets absorbed, let's say, you know, uh, into the into the ground, right, and not discharge into sewers and that kind of stuff. However, <laughs> the big contradiction, and I think you already feel it coming, is that there is a, a shopping mall underneath. So you will never ever be able to establish that 70% uh, absorption. There's no way, you know. And you can deal with like roof gardens and that kind of stuff. They don't count for 100% absorption. So we we can reach 52%. So we had to like. We wanted to do, we wanted to comply with, uh, with that requirement. So we came up with basically this idea, creating a second level of park, big uh, platforms, big funnels that would catch the water that then could then be um, either stored in like cisterns and that kind of stuff and then be discharged in the ground. And we calculated that it's possible to get even over 100% absorption while having a shopping center uh, underneath. And so we call that the floating forest. Right? It's got kind of like avatar, like floating mountains, kind of like elements that also create this icon iconic, uh, um, uh, uh, mem memorable image of the of the park, with the shopping center being um, being underground, right? So the floating forest, the floating forests, um, you know, they restore ecology. Actually, they restore ecology that was taken away, I would say, like 50 years ago. And uh, we, so we can uh, take, uh, take, take, take the water and, uh, and store it there and use it in the park and whatnot and regulate its discharge. The floating forest elements, and there's, uh, there's four of them, um, also are very suitable for the vert vertical circulation yeah, for, as a utility system. 
connecting the, the two layers of shopping mall uh, underneath and the parking underneath. Uh, and also, you know, we have the opportunity to create a, a you know, observation deck, which is very cool because that attracts people to this place, which is what you want, right? It's a shopping center. Um, and, you know, it's completely invisible uh, because it's subterranean and by creating visibility to the shopping center uh, establishes this economic mechanism, let's say. Um, besides that, uh, we have the opportunity to create like a super iconic uh, expression of a public space now, with this floating forest, right? Placing it in like a whole uh, series of like iconic park structures, let's say. Um, in addition, um, what we can do is kind of like in a sort of, um, you know, uh, poetic and metaphorical way establish uh, a recreation of Shanghai's original uh, silhouette, which was like hilly with trees on top, right? So um, the, the floating forest did, 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 did many things. Um, compared to the high rises, they're not even that, uh, that high. The highest is 35 meters high. Um, and you can see the view of the shopping center um, underneath. Yeah. So once again, um, and we came up uh, with this logo, you know, the for for the park, placing a park, a void, urban void, in in a, in, a, in a skyline, uh, becoming let's say a branding of a of a city, part of city, as well as a shopping center, as well as a public space. Um, lastly, um, if we have time, this uh, we recently finished a project in uh, Moscow, in, uh, in Russia. And I don't know if you, you guys remember this car. It's kind of like the Soviet uh, Lincoln. It's a Zil. Zil, yeah? This is what Brezhnev uh, and stuff, uh, these guys. I, I would like one, but you know, it's very hard to find nowadays. Um, so Zil was a mega automotive factory in Soviet times. And you know they had like a whole assembly line, hand assembly, like cars. And unfortunately, uh, due, uh, because of uh, perestroika, you know, this happened with that car, right? Because the Russians, when the borders opened, started to to buy bullshit brands like Chevrolets and um, you know Datsuns, Nissans, and that kind of stuff, Audis, and that kind of stuff. And you know, so the whole zeal, like massive. Uh, automotive factory, um, you know, went 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 bankrupt, and the, at that site, even larger than the Bata area, <laughs> uh, a completely new master plan uh, was created uh, by you know one a, a star Russian architect um, who approached us to design a park in two phases. First phase, which is now realized. And you know that will be followed by a second phase of a park that will be then be connected with a uh, with a existing tunnel. So the first phase of the park is 10 hectares in size, yeah, 10 hectares of park. And um, if you imagine a park of 10 hectares, this is this is the stuff. This is this is all the the MMC street furniture that will go into that park. All that's all that all that stuff. You know, and um, because there's a danger that is not going to be MM beautiful city city <laughs> furniture, we uh, we tried to tackle that uh, uh, that that danger, and we came up with the idea to basically consolidate all that stuff, all that clutter, all those elements into one uh, single element. Yeah. And so imagine that this that there's one element that consolidates all those functions and all that program. Yeah? Can you still follow me or not? <laughs> so one element, big snake going through the park that absorbs speakers, benches, toilettes, lighting, planters, play, everything is like in that in that element. So that was kind of our our, our, our vision uh, for the project. Here, so here you see our, our snake or our caterpillar, we call it. It's about two kilometers long, yeah, uh, going through that park. It's a nice, uh, you know, nice run or bike ride. And 
uh, uh, if, you, if you visit the park. And here you can see that, that element superimposed over our uh, park layout. So there's two levels, two experiences of park, which is the conventional ground floor park experience, and then there's the, the caterpillar experience, right? So you can basically decide one day to visit the park in a conventional way, stay on the ground, or you know, follow the route that goes completely crisscross through through everything, and uh, you know, follow that pergola experience or elevated walkway experience, and there's pavilions integrated in it, even a playground and a, and a pond, you know, or alternate between the two experiences. So uh, in Russia, uh, you have to design and build a park within one year. Right, so while we're dealing with all kinds of agency BS in New York, <laughs> during the time we already like designed and fully built a public park in uh, in in Russia. So you have to understand that you have to understand that you know your detailing have to be simple and doable. Everybody can make it, and you have to like be able to wing it on site and that kind of stuff. Uh, our name Caterpillar. Uh, S quickly got transformed into assembly line, right? The client loved the idea. Okay, we're making an assembly line. We make an assembly line or something, you know, uh, in 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 the park. That's basically that that it, it was it became the reference to the um, to the uh, industrial past of the site. So here you can see, fully built within within one year. <laughs> this drone picture was, uh, you know. Taken, and it looks kind of like the plan I showed um, earlier, right? Um, from uh, eye level, you can see the assembly line going crisscross through uh, the park. And what the assembly line does, um, such as the floating forest will do, and such as the, the shade structures in Vegas do, right? Because we, um, we at Melk, we, 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 we design our sites holistically. We have the opportunity to create verticality at day one, right? Establish like already a sort of immersive, immersive feeling from the day the park uh, opens. New park, um, as you can see, as the trees are small, right? There's not a lot of shade, not a lot of immersion, let's say. And um, but you know, it doesn't it doesn't disturb us. This, these pictures were all taken within two months after its opening, right? And actually, people. People go there and they hang out in summer and go crazy with, uh, I have to say, you know, the Russians know how to deal with public spaces. Um, in fact, you can see that the park opened before any other building in the, in the Zeal uh, development, right? So it's, uh, it's establishing um, a, a, an amenity and a draw for people to decide, okay, I'm gonna buy a condo or whatever um, around this, uh, this park. And the, like I said, it's, it's, although there, there's going to be a whole community around it, the park has already visited. Like, it's very popular in, uh, in Russia. People go there as a day trip to the park. There's nothing there, <laughs> but they, they already uh, go there to see the, this new public space in, uh, in the city. And you know, like I said, they go, they go crazy with it. The, the neighborhood is not even up yet. And, um, and it's already like uh, a day uh, trip. So here you can see the assembly line, very, very simple uh, detailing, people walking underneath it, uh, enjoying the space, uh, the openness of the, of the park in Russia. Um, underneath the uh, assembly line, on top of the assembly line as well, a certain areas is elevated uh, walkway, so you have a view over the park and the neighborhood. You can see how the uh, works, a uh, guy on top, um, you have people like walking on a higher level, and of course it's very, uh, all very playful while the construction is going on, um, going for a jog or, you know, electric whatever scooter. Um, integrated uh, furniture such as trash cans in the assembly line, um, benches, this is how we integrated that in a very simple way. The trash can that's sort of curling out of the court and steel. And here you see how the assembly line transforms into a uh, pavilion. As some are already, you know, open with like um, uh, 
stuff like sales centers and coffee shops and that kind of stuff. Um, then it um, ties in with a, a major um, a playground, right, which is very, very popular with uh, kids of all ages and, um, and moms. Yeah, so you can see how that, how that situation uh, works. There's another uh, uh, integrated piece of furniture uh, that we designed. These are pivoting, uh, pivoting benches that people have fun with. You know, you can see they, they rotate, right? And then it becomes evening. And then you can see the park without too many people during the, during the, during the night. Evening shot, night shot. And here you see the, the pond, which is quite a, quite a fun place. And then throughout the night, it becomes a morning again. And then repeat. Yeah? So you see people coming out during the morning, sitting around the, the pond, enjoying the park. Uh, and then the blooper. <laughs> These Russians, man, I tell you, this is crazy. They, they jump in water, you know, and that's something we could never have uh, uh, imagined. So um, we, we, we're dealing with it now. We don't want to end up with people getting, like, I don't know, Legionella and Salmonella and that kind of uh, weird diseases. <laughs> so, but, you know, they go, they go crazy. They just jump in that thing. They think it's a swimming pool. It's not, right? So... <laughs> Anyway, um, we're dealing with it, and uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So I'm Jerry uh, Melk. We're based in New York. Um, the word Melk is Dutch from the Netherlands. That's where I'm from originally. Moved to New York 11 years ago. Melk is Dutch name for milk. And people ask me, where does it come from? And I will say, it comes from cows. Yeah? <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, as you already introduced me in the right way, um, I am not the one that is actually implementing the projects. We are more the one that are preparing for you um, the ground, the pavement, to be able to finally work on, on concrete um, projects. So my name is Daniela. I uh, am founder um, of our studio in Vienna. Uh, I'm an urbanist urban planner, designer. Our projects range from small size urban designing master plans to the big regional planning. We also do strategic planning, um, which is uh, very, very demanding and challenging. Um, and, I, and I actually, I think this is really a, a great fun part of our job. But on the other side of the planning, what we also do is we very strongly work on um, the design of planning processes. And this makes it uh, very interesting to us because um, with this we can combine our two expertise, so the planning and the process or the dialogue because they go very much together. And especially when we're talking about working, redesigning public space, um, that's where the dialogue comes in again since public space, and it, and it goes within the word, um, belongs to everybody of us, belongs to the community. So it's very political, it's very strategic, and it's, it's, it's always about uh, bundling different interests. Um, so this is our, our work field. And my presentation is very, very different to the one that was just, uh, um, that was just presented by Jerry, since you were um, presenting perfectly designed, very, very impressive projects. I'm telling you a story, or actually I try to, to um, tell you more about what happens back in, um, in, 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 back, um, in the background, behind the scene. What it takes to prepare the projects, what it takes, um, what kind of work it takes to work together with the politicians to be able to create the ground to finally then launch competitions or, yeah, 
work on the project uh, to implement. And um, the talk um, or the title of the presentation is the Turnaround Challenge. Um, the story is about a very small town, so it's not about Moscow, Las Vegas, the big size project. It's, a very, it's, it's about a small town um, very close to Vienna, St. Pölten. I'm pretty sure not many of you have heard about that city. It's actually, it, it, it's not, it, 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 it didn't used to be so, so important, at, at least in our perception back in the days, but it's, it's trying to get there. So um, just to give you a little geographic orientation, um, St. Pölten is very close to Vienna. Um, so I would say that it's definitely part of the bigger metropolitan area. Um, and it's quite cute. It's, there's about 50,000 inhabitants living there. Um, so more, about, more or less like the size of Zlin, a little bit smaller. And it's very much characterized by the Baroque style, as you can see here with the main square. Um, but the city has had a little problem because it, was, it suffered quite a lot um, of its image as a former industrial city, classic worker city. Um, so this was the image that we all had when people would say they are from St. Pölten. You would think, okay, St. Pölten is, it stings, it smells, it's, it's not a place to go. There's not, nothing really to do there. But it, I think it, uh, it took up actually in the years in the late 90s when um, the federal state of Lower Austria decided that they need their own capital. This is when the story started, basically. So the city uh, was giving the title, the status of a real capital, and they had to build a government district there. They had to bring all the institutions that the city would need. Um, and it caught up again one more time when they established the high-speed train um, connection from Vienna to St. Pölten. So now within a less than 20 minutes, you can actually reach, reach those uh, two cities. And that, that pretty much gave, it, I would say, a strong dynamic, but still. St. Pölten has a, would say, an um, issue uh, with, its, with its, its, uh, its image. And um, the second part of the story, um, or this is actually when it really started, it was in last year in, in, or, or two years ago, in 2017, when this former workers' industrial city, mid medium-sized city decided, the, the municipality, together with the federal state, why not applying for the European cultural capital in 2024? That might sound really absurd that a city like this um, thinks it can really play on the, on the, um, on the stage of the European cultural uh, capitals. But when you think about it, and when you really understand what this instrument of a cultural capital is for and what kind of chance and opportunity lies within it, um, it, it does totally make sense. And this is something that the city really understood, that it is a big, big chance and opportunity to break new ground in the development of the city, because this is what it is about. It is not the year of the European cultural capital with fireworks and spectacular events and so on. It is what stays after that. So how can we use these dynamics to change places, to bring in more qualities, and especially in the public space. Because, yeah, this is, that, then I think we are really talking about sustainability in city development. Um, yeah, and this is where we came in. We won the international competition in not planning or designing the public space, but we won, it, we won the competition in accompanying the city, the stakeholders, um, the office that is taking care of the whole uh, of the whole thing um, into the application process. So we were the ones that drew out um, a planning process how to navigate this uh, ship through. Um, we were the ones together, of course, with a lot of stakeholders, with a big community to think about topics, trying to find a good story, a narrative 
for the application and understanding what are the needs of the city, what are the talents and the potentials and what are the, the, uh, the, yeah, the challenges that we really have to work on. So, we started working. Um, and this is how our work looks like. It's a lot of talking. And it's fantastic. It, this is really something I, I, need to, I need to underline, that when you start working on a process such as trying to get the title for the European capital, culture capital, that's a one-time chance when People, different people that had never ever anything to do with each other start to talk with each other. So different institutions, Department of Finance, Department with Culture, they start to get together. Private uh, institutions, politicians, and then even, even um, above the boundaries of the municipality. So it's the state, it's the federal state comes in trying to, to to collaborate and building a strong bond together with the city. That's something um, that gives you a tremendous dynamics and really there's such a strong power within this pro process that when you use it in the right way, you can really create um, good ground for transformation, for a project that will sustainably transform the city. So, um, doing a lot of talking, um, involving the community, the citizens, involving different stakeholders, representation, representative of the administrative, other politics, so everybody trying to get into that boat, doing different form, di dialogue-based formats, workshops, conferences, whatsoever, think, whatever you can think about it. And we pretty much understand, understood in the very beginning that St. Pölten, Although it's small and it has some great deficiencies, but there's also such a strong potential that lies within the public space. And the public space is probably, uh, yeah, we would say that is really the calling card for almost every city. Um, and the public spaces of the city, they form the stages for its social, economic, and cultural life. So these are here, we've got those at least three dimensions, the three different values that, that uh, public spaces bring along um, that we were working on. And then again, we were thinking on how to, how to do it. How, to, how can we get the right people involved? How can we get the decision makers involved, how do we finally um, trying to come up with, with good arguments and reason why this or that space is really valuable and has to be prioritized in terms of revitalizing and redesigning specifically for, for, um, for the city in, 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 in regard of, of the cultural capital. Our motivation was not really, you know, making the city beautiful for that very year. No, it is more using the power and the dynamics of this instrument, of this process to implement, pro to implement projects. So again, here, um, a lot, of, a lot of conceptual work, a lot of theoretical work, a lot of strategic work. Um, to uh, try to, to work on that planning process to finally get to a guiding concept to transform public spaces in the whole city. And I would like to get to you, uh, to, to um, take you along on a very short stroll through the city so you better understand what I'm talking about. It's a totally different situation than we just had at Jerry's uh, presentation where uh, you work on basically land that is not, there's nothing there yet. So for working from scratch, we have to work with the existing um, city fabric and structures. Um, this is a totally different work of field, um, challenging, um, and it's more about smaller intervention than the big, the big thing. Um, so 
main square has been um, redesigned a few years ago, works perfectly. Uh, now, I don't want to focus on the design. Um, you'll have to decide on your own. But you can see there's a lot of uses, a lot of purposes on the, on the site that actually helps very much this space to be alive and to activate it. So this space, even if it wasn't designed, it would still kind of work. Um, we can say that this is a lucky, uh, lucky parameters or lucky circumstances that we find here. But there's actually also other really central spaces in St. Pölten. Not far away from the space, from the square that I showed you before, there is the main square in front of the main cathedral that is nothing more but the biggest, the largest, and most central parking lot inside the historical city. So it is 6,000 square meters big, and you can see totally different situation, um, totally different framework or, or, or circumstances here. There is pretty much nothing happening, except from the church, it's losing a little bit of its importance. And there's a few doors, but there's no cafes, no restaurants, no nothing. So keep that space in mind. Then another really, I would say, probably the strongest and the most important um, structure in the network of the public spaces is the promenade. It's the ring that goes around the historical um, center that in parts look really nice. It looks like this. You can stroll, you can bike, drive your car, you've got trees, uh, some benches to sit down. I would say that this is probably some sort of, uh, of open space with a quality. But in some other parts, it looks like this. It is, again, just a street, purely reduced to its functions as a traffic space. Um, and then you've got the other side of St. Pölten. As I said before, if you remember that, that St. Pölten not long ago actually became the capital of the federal state of Lower Austria, um, this, the, the federal state decided on a new piece of land, which used to be a void, next by the river. They're going to build a new city district, a government district, and a cultural district. And they put all the big, um, the big cultural institutions there, from museum to opera house and so on. And uh, yeah, they, it's big architect. Architecture, um, you like it or not, it's not it's not me who decide. But seeing that picture and seeing this, it's a pure contradiction, and it's almost unbelievable that when you are walking when you are walking from the historical city center towards the cultural district, that this is the way that you have to take. And here you understand we've got an issue in this city that we have to work on, especially when the city is trying to become the next cultural capital of Europe in 2024. Here we've got an issue, not only in the quality of the open space, but also in orientation and in the, 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 the way people perceive this space and what kind of requirements they do. So, and if you don't want to take this road or this route to this uh, to the cultural district, you might actually want to take that one. This is the alternative, which of course is not better either. So, people they don't find their way to this part of the city, and now we are. We do have an issue because within the city, obviously, there is parts that are simply not connected. And maybe it also has to do with the fact that the historical town is uh, in the authority of the municipality of St. Pölten. And this other newly built city district is um, basically in the hands of the, of the federal state. We don't know, but you can see it even in the spatial structure. And then walking inside the, the, this district, you've got a lot of space in between the buildings. Um, and it's a lot of, it's basically a lot of space. It, it is too much space and it is not used. I've been there many, many times and also on different uh, times of the day. And to be honest, I've never really seen 
a lot of people walking there or kids hanging out, playing. There is no water like this. The, the nice pictures that we saw, that we've seen before, that Sh Jerry showed us of, of his design parks. There's nothing like that. And it has also to do, to do of course, with this very monofunctional um, city district, basically only culture but no housing, no, um, no shops, no real cafes, restaurants. So of course there is no big diversity and no, no huge um, frequency um, in this city district. And it feels like that when you leave the overground and you, hit, you walk downstairs on the underground space, that when they, that the planners and architects, when they did it back in the 90s, they almost put more energy in in trying to create uh, um, quality in the in the underground zones. Every, there's a huge parking lot. The entrance of the parking, they look like this, and you can see how much car-driven the planning was with this city district because the orientation for the car is just perfectly but i think they have slightly forgotten about the ab about the importance of the pedestrians because otherwise they would have i think better connected these two parts of the city and then there is the square of Europe. The square of Europe in uh, St. Pölten is one of the main entry points when arriving by car, but it is nothing more than basically a big intersection or a roundabout. So here again, we're gonna ask ourselves, is this an adequate quality of public space, especially when thinking about a, a cultural capital? We don't believe so. So our job, or this was our goal, the, set, the, the goal that we've set for ourselves was working out an overall picture which uh, can become a fundamental, coherent and consensual perspective in the development of the public space. So not single uh, or singular intervention, but more giving a master plan on the public space, trying to work out uh, different perspectives, developing and exploring variants. And as I've said it in the beginning, um, and, and, and uh, that Jerry said it also before, that one big job is as well identifying and bundling different interests. We've got the public, the community, the citizens, we've got the, the, the stakeholders, the decision making. But at the end of the day, we've got to have or hand over a paper, a concept that provides a base for a decision making and a recommendation of actions. So this was uh, this was what we've what we've worked on, and now I would just tell you or show you three or four little fields of of actions, um, because the whole spectrum would be too big um, that we pointed out, and I would say with working on these different um, fields we were able, or we will be able, um, to really prepare the ground for you guys to come in and take part in, in, in concrete projects. So one is dealing with the city development, with the, hist with the, with the historical development um, of the city and making the history visible again in the floor plan of the city, contouring the old town. So talking about the ring, I've been talking about the ring before, that is not really there yet, or, or, or at least only in parts. Um, we've pointed out that the city, did, that this is really one big working field that uh, the city has to deal with at least for the next years. Qualifying this, this space, the whole space, the whole promenade, of course, is a project that will keep the city busy for a long time and um, they won't be able to do it at once. But now, going back to the dynamics and the chance that we have with this, uh, with the cultural capital, we have to prioritize. And we are able to now um, redesign that part as a priorization towards uh, the, the year 2024, of course, only if we get the title, uh, but at least we're on the short list already. And this part is so important because it is one interlink, it's one, one major um, 
yeah, a, a linking space that connects the old town with with this newly built or developed city district with with the col all the cultural uh, functions. Um, and of course, we laid out principles of the promenade, expectations and requirements, what needs to be done and what uh, the design uh, needs to, to take care of once um, the, the landscape architects and architects come in. Um, to finally, maybe one day, um, find the promenade um, designed in a different way, like you see it here with, with these uh, three different kind of reference projects. Another um, field of action was focusing very much on the placemaking. Um, and there we do perceive the public spaces as stages and meeting places for the urban society. And now here it's not too much about design, but also um, more about the approach of design and how to create places, how to make places. Um, again, here we were not uh, working on, on single spaces first, uh, in the first place. We were more highlighting the, the potentials and the talents that the city has within a network of different squares and, place, and spaces and how to be able to connect them. And, and to prioritize it for the year 2024, again, um, we were able to finally um, bring down the... Um, the um, redesign of these two big squares. That was a big, big step for the city of St. Pölten. Of course, only if we get the title. Um, and now we are preparing um, the competitions um, for this one, this uh, 6,000 square meter big space or square. Um, so. And that will probably be the first big project that the city does in the year to prepare for the year 2024. Then this square will be the, the yeah, um, an, an important step and, and will become also a little bit the title of the, of the cultural capital. And here the question is, what is the role of the design in the process of creating a place? Because we have, first of all, work with the, with the existing structure, with the existing um, fabric. Um, but we also have to give that space a new meaning. It's always been used as a purely as a parking lot. So first of all, you have to take the, par the, the cars away and take away the functionality of a parking lot out of everybody's mind, um, giving this space a new perspective. And then understanding what this space needs in terms of uh, everyday use. I believe that um, suitability in terms of, of everyday use is probably the most challenging thing when you are redesigning um, or creating squares. Because it is easy to put cultural events there, to put a market there every second Thursday and give a meaning or a usage to this square. But what happens when nothing, ha when not actually nothing happens at this square? How will the people use it? And what does the design, or is, is the design able to contribute to the place making and to the creation um, of a place? Um, so this is gonna be um, the task for next year if we get the title, of course. Um, and to understand that the public squares enable urban life, because this is what we want there. Um, and there is, again, the, 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 the question of the role of the design that kicks in here. Um, another, another task or another field um, we, we had to work on um, is the integration of this different parts of the city. I told you before, you saw pretty uh, shocking pictures of the, 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 the streets that connect this historical center and the cultural district. So we have to work on the developing um, on sequences um, in the spatial structure. And here again, um, it's not, it's not uh, about working on every single street in St. Pölten, um, it's more about prioritizing and what we really need, what is now on the, on the, on the, on the number one um, agenda for the city, but always keeping that in mind uh, or seeing that in the whole picture. So 
working on the on the path, on the way from this newly designed square that hopefully will come next year, um, all the way to the to the new newly built city uh, or cultural district. And there's the question um, what art and art in public space can contribute. Because we have to work with the space that is there. We can take away cars, we will probably have to do that, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully that politicians will support that idea. We can take away the the, the parking space, but of course we cannot widen it up. We cannot make it bigger. But we have to work on the on 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 the perception of of the space and trying to use it as as a connection. And and those this is just um, a. Um, a reference project from Vancouver, Ali Oop, um, which was a winner of an of a international um, call of ideas. It did not take much to do that, but I think the effect that uh, this lane has um, for the entire city is pretty, um, um, is pretty interesting. Or the other one, here again, that's that's what design can contribute. That's that's what what um, small interventions can do. And 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 imagine that ha having something like that in in this um, path or or street in St. Pölten that can totally give new perspectives. And it will help the other part of the city, this uh, the the cultural district, to catch up, to bring people there, to connect different parts of the city. And then. This is just my last um, my last um, input um, on on this um, guiding concept of the open space is that we are not only or we sh we cannot only focus on the on the spatial aspect of of um, of the open space. It is also very much working on man on, on the aspect of management of structures and and strategies, and um, this one would focus or, or this this tart this goal focusing on opening up spaces to experiment, and using vacant spaces uh, differently. So like any other European city, and I'm sure this is also here the question um, or a challenge for. Lin, um, is that St. Pölten also has quite a few ground floor zones that are really not used, that are empty, but we know that they are actually also catalysts for revitalizing uh, open public space. So if the shops or the cafes, these, these structure is empty, of course it does not help the street to, to, to be activated and to bring back life to the city. So, and, and, and here it's not about design at all, it's more about the power of the city, it's, it's about enabling a structure that can help to catch up, that can help to bring back life into these ground floor zones, just like it happened in Vienna or in Graz, um, this is uh, the picture here, uh, another town in Austria. Um, there, they, the city put quite a lot of effort by actually um, creating an agency that deals with that empty spaces, trying to put new, u new uses to these spaces, trying to opening it up and letting things happen without having a real or a, a concrete idea straight from the beginning in their, in, in their heads. Giving it to people who have concepts, who have a vision, who want to try out, who, that have a community community in the background to work in a collaborative way. Even galleries or art space can, can, can work. And there's another example from Vienna, um, which is extremely strong. It's in a Nordbahnhalle, um, an old um, uh, void. is not used anymore. Unfortunately, it's going to be torn down next year. But they've, the city uh, gave it to some community and they were able to build a real place there and by by being there and by um, starting a process they actually contribute a lot to the place make it and they created an image and they created the place in itself so this is a task that uh, we've also basically given to the city of St. Pölten we um, they, the, the city marketing de department is putting also this target on their agenda, trying to be an interlink between um, people who are looking for empty spaces and people who, uh, who, who own them. So now, 
getting to a conclusion and 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 trying to um, to bring some principles along. Um, this is what what comes up to our minds when working uh, when working with the public space. First of all, that uh, placemaking is a collaborative process and it requires the involvement of many. And there's a few questions that come along with that idea. That it's of course who to involve, who is the expert, the community as an expert is I think a very interesting thought, and how to receive support also in the decision making process. Because if there is no support and no 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 go. Um, um, no preparation on the strategic field, there is no project that can be implemented afterwards. And creating a place goes beyond design, of course. What is the approach to design and what is the role of the design in the process of creating a space? I think this is also very much what Jerry was talking about. And then it is, of course, about developing a strong vision that guides what will happen um, in the particular space, who will take part in that process, and, of and also asking um, ourselves, how realistic and practical is it? How innovative does it need to be? Um, and thinking about the long-term use rather than short-term ideas. And I'm going to close now my talk um, by a few really important statements that first of all, placemaking is a lot about the practice in common sense and uh, about doing rather than talking about it. This is also now taking up the idea of giving space to experiment. You can do that very much and very well in with the public space. Um, giving space for experimenting, I just said that, rather than termin terminating all the function and uses straight from the very beginning. And I'm going to close that, and I know everybody here is a very much aware of that, but still it is extremely important to un outline that one more time, that places carry an enormous social and cultural importance, of course, not only economical. And they are the stages and meeting points for the urban society. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentations. I have one question. All these images, all these images were presented in a, in a nice weather, sunny, sunny days, uh, nice evenings. How you are thinking about the landscape and urban connection in case the weather is not nice, is uh, windy, rainy, or even is a winter time? How you work with this? information and how you integrate it to the landscape principles. Jerry, you want to go first? Or is, is the question to a specific speaker or generally? Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> it's all integrated. Yeah, they have to function uh, year round. Yeah. How? We, how? The question was how, how you think about it and how you create the spaces. You have to, you have to think of seasonality and think of uh, the qualities during the winter, usually, especially in Moscow. <laughs> the park won't be so, uh, you know, so, 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 so heavily visited. But you, know, you have to, you know, you have to think of water features that are not ugly and bare and empty when it's cold, uh, but, you know, turn into something else. You have to turn. Uh, you have to think of, uh, you know, your, the seasonality of your of your um, vegetation. You know, you have to think of uh, how to get rid of snow, snow plowing, where the where the snow goes. Um, so rain shelters, uh, everything. Yeah, that's all integrated. Yeah, although it freezes in Vegas too. Daniela, would you want to add something to it as well? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we'll open up to another question. Next question. Um, there's a gentleman in the center here. Okay. We've got a microphone coming. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Van Eyck. Uh, how or uh, where you find all the inspiration for your project, especially for the for the structures because they they are very well integrated in in the surroundings they they look like they were there for ages and ages really and in nature or it's just the 
an idea and you use it for, for your project. For example, like the, uh, the, the, the pink mushroom from, from Las Vegas. How do you find the inspiration for, for that thing? First of all, you totally look like a character from the Game of Thrones. <laughs> who, who, went, who had a, just had a haircut or something, you know, now that the whole series is over. Thanks, so. man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, people, people always, always, uh, very often um, come with this question. How, what's your inspiration? What's, describe your creative process. What is, you know, and that's kind of what I try to uh, represent in the sponge thing, right? You basically have to soak up a lot of influences, like Daniela explained, um, listening to a lot of people, right? So uh, before you start a design process, you have to like, load yourself up with, you know, with the anecdotes and the stories and the sentiments and try to understand what people want and, and, then, and then sort of translate that into you know, into a, into a design. And, you know, um, uh, if, if you look in design schools and university, and I, I'm also uh, an educator, you know, you, you try to explain that there's a certain order that you have to go through it, but it's kind of BS. It's bullshit, you know. <laughs> Uh, as, you, as many of you know, the creative process is a, sort of this magical uh, thing that just happens somewhere in between your daily life and... Like an epiphany or something like that, just... Like just what? Ep epiphany, like yeah, something well, divine bang in your head. Yes, yeah, I mean, you, can, you can force yourself towards it by making sketches and that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, but it, 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 it comes from information information that you can achieve through uh, uh, communication, right? So, and then you, you, you understand uh, what the outcomes approximately needs to be, right? So in the, in the, in the example that you uh, mentioned, the Las Vegas uh, project, you know, it's, it was all about, okay, reaching that moment where everybody is mobilized, right? because that's basically what it's all about, yeah? or Daniel's the story was all about that, mobilized to a position that they want to achieve the same goal, right? And that same goal, that goal became, in, this, in the example that you asked for, yeah. um, uh, authenticity of the desert, right? So, and then you try to find, let's say, um, you know, um, uh, a translation into a physical form for, for that and take inspiration from like, I don't know, desert, flowers, cactuses, cacti, and colors, and that kind of stuff, you know. Plus, you know, the functionality that you want to achieve, right? So I hope that answers your... Yeah, thank you so much. It's always very difficult to answer a question. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I see another hand back in there. I don't see who that is, but please keep your hand, okay. Hi, this is a question for Jerry. Um, how do you convince the clients to spend, you know, the amount of money to create these amazing sculptures? Because, you know, at the beginning of a project, they've got these massive aspirations for, you know, really exciting, innovative, new, uh, fresh ideas, and you come up with a design. But then, slowly as you work your way towards the construction, it gets value engineered and eaten away, at, and actually that whole concept that you come up with and the design kind of gets a little bit lost. I, I know what you mean. It's uh, the client is always interested in a, in a return of investment, right? The ROI, and um, you know, so you go, th so they always want the same thing, as you know. Um, they want something original, but at the same time, it has to be done before, right? <laughs> because then they have an example and they can learn from the mistakes. So you talk about it, you talk about, it. You, you communicate, you talk about examples and. Um, and, and, and I mean, uh, try not to sell them sort of like a fake story, but you know, something that's actual, actually, actually works, right? As a, as a, as a, as a mechanism for, you know, returning their, their investment. So I think 90% of what we do as designers, it's kind of like a, like a, a, a 
almost dirty to talk about, right? But 90% of what we do is create stuff for other people to make money off, right? And you just have to be honest with that um, and, and, and try to get your uh, satisfaction uh, uh, out of that. But, you know, mobilization, communication, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, dinners and beer drinking. That's how I do it. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we have a question right here. If we can get a microphone to this corner over here. We need to invest in more microphones, it looks like. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm slightly in the off. Uh, Florian Frotcher from, from Woods Baggett. I've got a question that I think is more aimed at, uh, at Daniela. Um, you mentioned, uh, but it's, it's generally the the activation of ground floors is ultimately, obviously, at the at the at the heart of, of public design. And you mentioned something that I found quite interesting: the um, uh, an agency uh, that, if I understood correct, uh, correctly, um, reallocates or allocates vacant uh, spaces and and use for them. And there are two questions to that. One is. Um, how, how do you do that? I, because I assume that the vacant spaces are owned by a plethora of people rather than just one entity is not owned by the city. So how, or, or not, that is one of the questions. And then to define uses for all of this, uh, slightly wider question, how do you, do you go beyond your gut feeling? Do you use data? Do you um, uh, use uh, um, evidence-based uh, design technologies for this? Yeah, it, it is, as a matter of fact, a big challenge to work on these vacant spaces for a city. Um, first of all, all of them are usually privately owned. Um, so first of all, um, you've got to convince also the owner to put it on the market for free, basically. Um, there is a reason why those spaces are empty year since for years already and, and the convincing the beer drinking comes back in <laughs> no and you have to put together the different um, different institutions and and uh, departments of the city so this um, agency that is working with the vacant spaces in vienna for example it's funded by the department of finance culture and city development so they departments that usually they don't really go together but there's a program behind that that um, they're all pulling on the same string and have the same goals and there's money involved in calls that it needs to be funded and there need there it needs people that are out there that are the ones that uh, they are yeah they take care of it they talk to the people they try to to uh, find good locations. Um, and of course, they also work with data. So they do also analytical part, and they try to come up with concept what would work in what location and what wouldn't probably, yeah. Thank you. OK, so we have a time for one more question. I see one more hand, which is perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about the policing of behavior or um, the enforcement of encouraged behaviors in public spaces. Jerry, you showed the badges of security guards. And I would assume that as a privately owned public space, there's a guard who will come and say, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but when you're looking at an example across an entire city where it's all public space, and it seems like you're working in an exercise in improvisation. Um, what activities are going to go into these places? So Daniela, I think my question is more to you. Um, who, who decides what activities are allowed and encouraged um, in the spaces that you're working in? I would say it's pretty much the owner. In your case, it's probably the pr private client that has an idea. No, um, the it's the public. public. I'm being polemic now. Um, <clears throat> but in, in terms of the city, when it's public, it's owned obviously by the, by the city municipality. So of course, we have to understand um, what is the importance, what, um, and what is the value of this space 
and um, we are planners, we are urbanists, strategists, so of course we do understand and, and we can give guidelines and draw out a concept um, for all those spaces um, that finally can put then in a in an assignment uh, for an international competition, for example. Um, but I think what is another a, a very important aspect of this public space, um, or it actually it doesn't matter if it's public or privately owned when then it's used publicly, um, is that it also needs um, a cura cur curation. Cura it, it needs somebody that, um, how, what is the word? Yeah, a curator in the back. So, and somebody that takes care of this space. Um, you know, it's not just, you can't just put down a wish list and okay, I'm gonna put that furniture and I want this and that. Somebody needs to deal with that. And um, so there you've got the management structures also in the background that uh, just like the facility management for a building, um, you also have to have that for the public space, especially when you would like to change the, the, the uses or the functionality of that space, turn it into a market, activating it with uh, events and so on. So there's somebody, there's a structure behind that that uh, um, puts out a program. You would like to add something to that? Well, no, I, I, I agree. I think. Um well, I think ultimately the owner of every space, every public space, is the public. Right? Though they have to take ownership and they have to develop sort of a pride for the space. It's their, um, you know, it's their living room. That's where they live, right? So the program, the content, uh, and not just the visual content, but the actual uh, program uh, in the spaces is basically devoted and at the same time determined by, you know, what, what the community wants. So with every project that we do, every project, whether that's privately or publicly owned, doesn't matter. You talk with the public. Yeah. And especially in the, in the United States, as you know, like, these community outreach processes are an integral part of every project that you, that you do. Because you know the 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 community is is very powerful. You know they can, in in the case of of the states, they can like, you know, it can reach to lawsuits against like developers and completely you know kill kill projects if it's not if they're not consulted, right? So so what you what you were showing in Austria, we have that uh, Austria, right? And uh, we have that in the United States, but to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> to the extreme that you need to build constituency, you need to establish buy-in of the public. And you know what? That's actually quite cool to do. You know, we always have a lot of fun, uh, you know, uh, getting the input uh, from, uh, from the public. You get some good ideas out of it as well. Yeah. Oh, policing. Policing. In the case of a privately owned uh, public space, um, it's, it's about control, right? It's about, crea uh, 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 it's about the, the, the private owner, developer, or some operator, or whatever, um, you know, being able to control the quality and uh, the curatorial element of the programming of that space. It's a, it's a little bit more, let's say, less uh, democratic. You know, in, in, in the case of uh, Las Vegas Strip, just like at Times Square and the kind of stuff, there's like Batmans and SpongeBob's and Wonder Woman's and, you know, all, like, say, uh, harassing uh, the public, asking for money for, 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 for a picture. Uh, that's, that's something you can control, that kind of mess uh, a little bit more when the space is privately owned. When it's publicly owned, you have to come up with different uh, mechanisms and make it more uh, resilient to do to that that kind of uh, stuff. For example, in the United States, you can't just simply send away homeless people, right? They're a fact of life, and so basically, public space is public in the largest sense of the word, so that it allows for uh, occupation by uh, by homeless, uh, the transient uh, population, uh, for example. Although you know, even on the public uh, level, uh, things are 
in terms of control rapidly changing, right? With CCTV camera systems and, uh, and, and, and uh, disclaimers and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's all, it's all in, all in the sponge. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's really funny how uh, life can uh, surprise you because only two days ago uh, I was meant to sit uh, just close to you among uh, among you, uh, but 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 some in some strange. Uh, 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 coincidence, I'm standing here at the podium and I'm about to present you one of uh, my favorite projects that we design in our studio. Uh, so thank you MMCT for this opportunity to show you this project. Uh, the project I'm going to uh, tell you about is located in Prague, the capital of Czech Republic. Uh, by the time we have been asked uh, to prepare a design concept uh, to this area, it was a brownfield, it was only a fraction of factory famous for its aircraft and uh, uh, engines uh, and uh, cars as well, which have been produced there by almost a decade. Uh, if we look at the history, uh, we can see that there has been a, a, a rise and fall of uh, quality scoping changes in uh, political establishments. Uh, the factory was built actually in 1913 by Joseph Walter, just a couple of years after he started uh, his business uh, with uh, uh, repairing uh, bicycles and motorcycles, but uh, the factory was uh, much more known for uh, its uh, uh, aircraft engines, which they produced there. Uh, by 1949, the factory was communized and renamed uh, to Motorlet. In 1995, the factory was renamed back to Walter. And in 2008, the fascinating history of the factory ended, but soon after was followed by uh, the new rebirth of Waltroka as a modern residential area. And then uh, nine years later, the first residents uh, started to live uh, in Waltroka. Uh, I will just show these couple pictures uh, uh, I've made when we started the actual uh, project. Uh, the, co uh, the condition uh, after the design process, we were really excited to see how, uh, how the space looked like, the industrial architecture and the really specific uh, genius lossy of that space. So uh, we decided uh, to try to convert the value of this uh, uh, private space to a new public space. The idea uh, that, uh, that led us to this is a short story of a logo we have discovered in our analysis stage. And uh, yeah, there will be a short and funny story uh, about the deer as well at the end, so bear with me. Back to the logo. Uh, the first logo was designed in 1911 and uh, was made by a combination of a wing and uh, the letter W. Uh, after the factory was communized in 1949, uh, the new management, the, the state, uh, they wanted to distinguish uh, the name, of course, from the original one, so they renamed it to, to Motorlet. But what I think, they were too lazy, so they, uh, or, or creative, depends. So they didn't design a new logo, they just uh, twisted the original one, and uh, there, was a, there was this uh, letter change in, in W to M. So a simple change. Uh, then later in 1995, after the Velvet Revolution, the logo changed back to, to Walter again. And uh, this, uh, this really sim simple logo recycling inspired us and supported us in, uh, in our feelings about the place and uh, about the specific genius Lotzi uh, we saw there. So we took, we took the recycling strategy as our main concept. And uh, as our main concept to reinvent the value of the place. Uh, we spent uh, really hours and maybe days uh, in the factory, walking around and searching for, for materials that would be suitable for recycling. Uh, we found different materials for parts, we found different materials for, for walls, uh, for echo features, and as well uh, for, for playgrounds. 
as you can see on those pictures. Maybe uh, I start to show you uh, uh, the initial s the state when we came to the project. Uh, the whole area was uh, made uh, basically from two different parts. There was a woodland on the right side and uh, there are some empty plots from, uh, from the, the X factory that was there. Uh, the existing woodland, uh, as you can see on those pictures, was uh, was really neglected. So the first thing we, we did uh, on this area was that we uh, uh, cut the old and bad trees and uh, we transformed this, this place to, to a park from, from this uh, woodland. Okay. After maybe a year of designing, we came up with a concept that looked somehow like this, but uh, it was made basically from uh, two parts. There was a linear park, the modern one, and there was a topological park, the more natural one. Uh, we had uh, uh, designed, uh, uh, we, we characterized the, the linear park as a more formal type of design uh, with more higher material quality and of course more with more future features. And then the topological park, which had a more naturalistic type of design with less de detail and uh, more recycled materials. And now please uh, let me walk you through the park uh, in some pictures. Uh, at the very beginning of the park, we have a water feature, uh, which was inspired by a 2D plan of uh, one famous uh, engine, which was produced uh, in the factory. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, there is one fun picture, the kid like it too. And then we have, of course, the open green space, uh, which kids used for playing football or just uh, laying down in the grass. Uh, you can also see on the picture that the design of the main paths uh, and roads uh, in the area is uh, very simple and very strict, uh, which uh, with sharp angles, uh, uh, which is uh, reflecting the industrial history of the place. Uh, then we are coming to the playground where we used uh, the, the first uh, recycling uh, uh, thing that we found on the place. That was this uh, red gas pipe. Uh, then thanks to MMC, they, uh, they help us to design this uh, beautiful uh, playground, this special uh, aeroplane, which is only here on Valtroka. Uh, a next picture from, from the other side. This is a really funny picture, which I realized after, after I, I took it that uh, if you can look closer, there is a kit on the playground, uh, which is <laughs> really up on the top on the airplane. And that really makes me happy that you can see that nowadays kids are uh, really enjoying the play and aren't afraid so of playing. Yeah, we have a flower bed as well for people they just want to relax and sit down in the park and enjoying the nature with really beautiful uh, spring effect of flowering. Uh, of course, a fitness area. And then uh, there is a next recycled uh, thing. That's the, that's the logo that we used from the old factory. Of course, uh, there is this uh, uh, this part where the uh, topological park begins and you can see the real difference between the modern part and the naturalistic one. So you can see we, we used uh, the meadows instead of uh, just lawns. There is a natural amphitheater. The sitting uh, things, uh, the parts are made from uh, 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 these blocks, concrete blocks from uh, uh, X uh, st stairs. Okay, next one, that's the, that's the amphitheater again. Okay, this, these are some details from the park uh, showing uh, what type of, uh, um, what type of, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really nervous. Uh, stepping stones are made from, uh, from a, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have too much papers here, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so you can see the details here uh, showing uh, all the materials we used uh, from, from the X fabric. Okay, we used uh, it for stairs uh, and the walls as well. 
we have echo features as uh, as well in the park. That's uh, that's this really small thing for uh, lizards. And then a natural playground at the top of the of the hill, uh, made from stepping stones from a, a old drainage canal that was in the park. Uh, we try to use it most as uh, natural uh, uh, features, so we we used most uh, 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 wooden playgrounds. Yeah, some details from the top. Swing, yeah. There is a shelter as well in the park. Again, it's uh, it's inspired by aviation. The design and uh, this running track where we use this stone as a landmark in the in the running trunk. Okay, and the story about the deer. That's the funny one. When we came to the project uh, uh, from the, in the beginning, uh, somehow no one knew how, but there was a. Uh, there was a deer in the park. No one knew how it came there because uh, the place, uh, the factory, uh, is circled uh, with four line streets and uh, it's not easy really to come there. But uh, I met this uh, deer personally and believe me, you don't want to meet a deer who was really scared, maybe more than me at the time. So we ran both in the different directions. So I was scared like hell. <laughs> and the client was uh, was hunting this deer for almost a year, and it was a quite story in the news in, in Prague. And they finally caught him after a year, and now I think uh, it's living in peace in some of the Czech uh, national parks. Uh, so in the memory of, of this deer, the first inhabitant of uh, Valtroka, we placed a new one there, made from wood, and we provided him with three does, so he's not alone there. So those are the, the, those are the four uh, first inhabitants in the park. Yeah, maybe the last info. The, the, the area of the park is almost three hectares. Uh, the project phase was almost three years and uh, the construction phase was uh, two years. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
I believe that physical space can definitely influence how we are living our lives, can uh, can make our lives better. That's that's the fact. And, uh, and of course, the, the scale of a building or street was too small for me. So um, I moved to the scale of the city and I, ha I have it all. I have a green infrastructure, I have a public space, I have a buildings. And, and the first time I became, uh, or I stepped into the discussion about the city was a project called Urban Interventions. It was a project uh, where we tried to, to ask, or we asked uh, our colleagues, architects and designers, to show uh, or to present their ideas they have about the public space in our city. You know this uh, old, old, uh, old school architect who's waiting for the phone call for, for, for the answer? Architect always waiting for the answer, right? But we, just, we said, yeah, maybe we should be the one who is uh, putting the answer on the table with the, um, with, uh, sorry, for, uh, architects waiting for the question. And uh, we always, uh, and we will be uh, giving the, having the question and also putting on the table the answer as well. So the idea was um, we ask our colleagues to identify the, the problematic spots in public space and bring the solution. And the main idea was to give to the city and, uh, and its inhabitants uh, many nice uh, solution of problematic public spaces. We did it in Prague, we did it in Brno and in Bratislava. And after we just open it and everybody who wants to do that, we call them local heroes, organize in urban intervention in the city. In the end, it was more, uh, it was around the 20 cities, also Zlin. Uh, the city who made very nice, a lot of projects in urban interventions, and more than 1,000 projects for public space was created and donated, in a way, to the, to the cities with this, with this. Of course, there was always an exhibition, always a catalog. It was very important, so now I have 20 uh, catalogs with many projects in, in my home. Uh, because of this project, I, I met, I knew a lot of people who are who are uh, willing to donate to their cities or community, not only their free time, energy, but mainly their know-how, their knowledge. And too many times we were stopped by board like, it's not possible. Too many times we meet this, or, or we, don't, we don't have competence, or the worst one, get used to it. Uh, yeah, we, we, don't, we, don't, we, are, we, we don't accept it. My generation or my community in Brazil are not doing it. So, once again, I used my capacity or capability of an architect who is, a, is somebody who is able to put people around the table and uh, maybe to, do, to start the discussion and maybe have some solution from the discussion. So, I did. I put uh, people around the table, and three years ago, we start to, to talk about what can be, Brat how we can make Bratislava better. What, what, what are the, all the things which we need to change to have a better city? We love Bratislava. I lived in Rome for four years. I spent some year in New York or in London. But we decided to live in Bratislava, in Slovakia, because we love that city, we love the scale, we have our relationship, parents, and so on. So we decided, and we, we, I connect the group of experts. Uh, the name of it was very simple, Platform for Bratislava. And we spent two years of thousands, of hundreds of meetings, discussions, on very professional levels uh, to create a book called Plan Bratislava, which is a complex vision of the capital in 12 thematic chapters, but uh, better is maybe to say is just a manual for better Bratislava. So the main question is, if now we are running the city, this was the question I asked uh, my colleague and friends three years ago, what we want to do. And this is the book. Uh, the book was, was uh, this is the small version. In fact, we put together 600 pages of quite detailed material. Uh, but after we publish it, we found a very good publisher who published it and, uh, and uh, we make it smaller and more accessible for the general public because that was the main thing. We didn't want to to stay close in our, in our, in our heavy 600 pages book. Uh, we want to people be able to read about 
how Bratislava can be a better city. And in a way, in the end, we sell uh, nearly 3,000 copies of this book, which in, uh, for Slovak uh, scale is a quite, uh, quite a success. Uh, I mean, the, 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 what is imp uh, interesting for, uh, for you who are not, um, maybe don't know where Bratislava is, is that um, we did something Everybody say it's not going to be successful. We try to 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 came with a program and to win election with a program. And in this part of Europe, it's not happening so much. It's important to be in television. It's, more, it's important to have a face who is well known. Uh, but nobody really reads your program. Everybody told me. Yeah, but we we try to do that. And and uh, I think the the fact that we have the perfect knowledge of what we are going to do the first, second day, third day, first month, fifth month of when we are going to win, or first four years, was absolutely important. And I tried to write this book because of urban intervention. I had this Fulbright scholarship at Columbia University for eight months research, where I was researching how uh, public or how active public or communities can change the cities. And after I understand that we need to go to the politics to do that really. So why, why am I right now? And I did try to do it in uh, 2011, I remember, and nobody really decided to help me. But when I say uh, to everybody, yes, uh, give me your ideas, sit down with us uh, around the table and, and do the, this vision or this book with me, and if I'm going to win the election, I will realize uh, uh, your ideas. Everybody jump in. And I need to do, I'm really appreciated the fact that all the people, in the, in the end it was 76 people who, were writing the, uh, who wrote this book, uh, believe in, in, in the fact that I can uh, win the, the election. Of course, and we did it uh, because we love Bratislava. That's, that's, that's for sure. And this is something you never can buy with any money or any political position or whatever. If somebody just want to have a better city, very simple, uh, that's the energy you cannot stop. And that was the main reason where, of, of, of our success in, 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 in this uh, in this action, and I need to say, I saw it also after and during the elections, during the campaign, uh, I had a very, very strong uh, base of volunteers who also believed this idea and also wanted to have a better city. So uh, there is a book uh, with 12 chapters, uh, it's all in Slovak, but uh, maybe three main things I really kind of took care of in the book. Uh, first one is public space. Of course, uh, I'm as an architect, somebody who travels a lot. I'm very big believer in the public space, and everybody already was said here. And I'm happy that Igor Marko is here, famous architect f uh, from London, who really, and he's Slovak from London, who really helps. And he wrote one of the main chapters in this book. Uh, the second very important topic for me was communication. Uh, today, you have, in Slovakia, you have still the um, government, state, or cities who are not really able to communicate with citizens. Uh, of, of course, participation is the, the uh, very important part of it. And if I'm talking about participation, I'm talking about the, the fact that you, you want to know, the, in, really you want to know the opinion of public. It's not because you need to do that, because you have it in some kind of uh, process. And I talk. Uh, uh, I, have, I was in the discussion in Paris on this Monday, and uh, in panel there, uh, there was a uh, deputy mayor of Toronto, wonderful woman, and she told me one thing, uh, that in the second you walk in the room full of people, and you are doing it, uh, doing it only because you need to do that, you lost. Yes, that, that's the story. The communication and mainly participation must be something which a politician want to do that and is not doing it because it's looking good or for marketing reason. I can say something about it from my election uh, and when I started to be mayor in this, uh, December, December, I had already 11 uh, public meetings uh, with inhabitants 
Uh, yesterday I had a beautiful meeting, three hours long, about the parking policies we are doing in Bratislava right now. The third, third thing is, of course, green infrastructure. That's, that's fantastic. This is uh, very real. I, I, I think it's very necessary. And it works fantastic in a fantastic way with uh, public. Everybody, when you say tree, you, you are successful. When you plant the tree, everybody's clapping, which is OK. Sometimes uh, we need it as a politician. But it's also very, very important for Bratislava. Anyway, the very important uh, word for me in this case, it's together. Uh, you can have any idea you want to have it. You can be a genius, which is not my case. But you, if you are alone, you cannot accomplish nothing. That's, that's what I learned from this process. I need to say uh, I'm, a, um, I'm a long runner. Uh, I have a band. Uh, 24 years we, I played with my friends for childhood in a band, which is nearly mission impossible. And now when somebody from my political opponent, opponents want to, to, to say me some, say, uh, or push me in some direction, I always remember the, the years in the band and all the fights we, doing, we did and we're still doing. And the word together is super important. And for me, the answer was, of course, uh, create um, group uh, of called Team Valo. Valo is my name. Team is it's Team Valo. And uh, we run uh, for a different position in the city. Uh, me as a mayor, my other friends uh, as uh, members of city council. And um, it works. So um, this is how it uh, what happened in November. I, I became a mayor of Bratislava. And this is what I'm doing uh, in these days. Uh, this, this is a real photo. It's not like publicity picture. So uh, we really stand around the table and talking about the things. What is important and the main and very important thing is that without this book and without two years' work uh, I did before the election, uh, I, will, I will be completely lost. So uh, the, my experience from the last six months is that this book, I didn't even know it before, became so important, like my Bible, and I'm just following all the things from the book. I need to say, in the first six months, we accomplished everything we want to accomplish in the first six months. So we are very happy. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, hello, question to Mr. Valo. What is the main difference between being a musician, architect, and major? Uh, yeah, the, the music is my hobby, of course, but architecture and the music are nearly the same thing. It's, they are very, and there are a lot of famous architects, not, uh, I'm not talking about myself, of course, uh, who, who are musicians, who are a musician, because you have a rhythm, you have a structure, you have a concept, and it's always all uh, the same in the music, but the, the, to stay 24 years in a band with your friends from childhood, it really helps me to be able to control myself and be patient because we are fighting all the time in the band. And now I'm trying not to fight in the, in the city council and with the mayors of our neighborhood. And, and in a way, uh, it sounds maybe strange, but it really helps me. Uh, give me some, uh, some hints for political work. And yeah, that's the mayor. Yeah, I learned yesterday that um, Jerry Van Eyck, our first speaker, also used to be in a band. It was a heavy metal band, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a, a question right here up front. Hi, thank you for lectures. Uh, I would like to also ask Valo about uh, once I heard your dialogue where you presented Trnava project, which is a very nice project, and there were one question uh, like how it was in terms of your cost, company, and hours. And that time your answer was obviously like architects always answer that uh, you did a lot of variation and that it was really difficult. I would like to ask you in, in this content, could you influence now this uh, like also uh, environment between architects, municipality, and like ours would be really interesting for me to know. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Of course, uh, Project Ternava was uh, seven years of doing thousands of variations and with a very good client, but a uh, client who, who watch every detail, uh, maybe sometimes too much. And uh, of course, uh, the question was right. What we are doing as a city, uh, I, I have it in the plan Bratislava, and Igor Marko was one of the authors of it. We have uh, uh, some institute called Metropolitan Institute for Bratislava, M uh, MIB, many in black in the, in the end. And, um, and uh, we have a unit for uh, organizing uh, architecture competition. So that's the main thing. Uh, we are going to open much more. During the last four years, uh, for with the old mayor, uh, Bratislava did organize maybe one competition in four years. We are going to organize in first year uh, five competitions. So we are going to open, uh, open it's of course for architects. And in terms of ours, I, I, I still don't know. We are going to push architects to give us a lower possible uh, price, as <laughs> of course, <laughs> to not spend so many public money. But it will be definitely fair, fair price. OK. Um, are there any other questions in the audience? We have a questions right here. Daniela, our second speaker, is going to ask a question. Yeah, my question um, would address the flexibility of this uh, book. I, I, yet I did not read it, but I'm very interested in reading it. I quite, quite yet did not understand whether it's more a plan or a strategy. But um, how does it deal with the flexibility that is might be needed? You mean flexibility in terms that somebody else can use it, maybe, or uh, if it's uh, something we can uh, we can change in the time, the, the solutions. Of course, uh, I spent. We did a, the the platform for Bratislava wasn't a group of people with some kind of pink sunglasses or how you say it. We already knew what are going to be a limitation in the legal, economical environment with all our uh, or our. Uh, visions or a plan, a solution. And I was very surprised when I became mayor how we were accurate in this. So, uh, so now I need to say in the first six months, uh, everything we wanted to uh, accomplish, we did it. So we maybe are changing the things to, uh, to our plans. We are changing into the bigger plans because we understand we can do it and it works. Maybe it sounds very too much, but these are just the first six months. Uh, and what is interesting, of course, in the book you have like com com complete concrete solutions for Bratislava's problem with numbers and with processes and so on. What maybe can be interesting for this part of Europe where the rise of populism is quite, uh, quite quick and, uh, and uh, significant is that the people don't want to hear the solid uh, marketing stunts, or they really they are really interested in the program, which um, didn't happen in Slovakia. You didn't have like serious program in years in in, in, in communal politics, in local politics. There was always like uh, more benches, more uh, trees, uh, everything for seniors or for older people, and that's it. But I don't know if I answer your question. Sorry for that. I try. Okay, there is a question up front here. Thank you. I understood that uh, you've got quite a good uh, Bible of visions. Uh, what do you consider to be the most important uh, accomplishment so far? The, my my um, my motto, or how you call it, in elections, was that, that I'm uh, uh, born in Bratislava, and I have a good plan, and I have a good team. So I was always saying to people, I will bring a team of people with me. And from everything we did, from transparency, or now we're doing the most difficult thing, people are going to pay for their parking lots uh, money, which were free. Uh, we, we, 
uh, what I did that I was able to make the, this narrative or this uh, aim of making our city Bratislava better interesting for very good quality people, very good professionals. So I bring the, firstly I bring the real team in, into the city. Uh, two weeks after I, I became mayor, I had already all my people from my team around me, which was very important. And I would like to believe that uh, beca also because of me, uh, because of my, uh, uh, what I want to achieve with Bratislava, uh, that I want to do it transparently in a very good professional way, and it's all about to have a better city, is attractive for good uh, young professionals, also Slovaks who are studying, for example, abroad. So they they come to us and they, they will become a, uh, somebody who works for Bratislava. This is the, the most important things for now, I think. Because, as I said, you can have a thousand ideas, whatever. Uh, we just uh, very uh, in environment of the city is that we we didn't we didn't uh, have to ex uh, make experiments. We just need to copy a good ideas from other cities. That's very good. Every mayor always uh, talking about own successes, and you can very easily uh, choose uh, what. what uh, so so what is important? The ideas are, are on the table, but somebody need needs to 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 do these ideas and that and we need people so i hope and it's already happening more and young not only young but more professionals are coming to bratislava to work for the city thank you um so we have time for one more question um, if there is a question in the audience so i guess my question is um I don't know if I'll be able to read the book. I don't know if you have it in English, in an English version. But um, what are the, th let's say, the three main challenges in the public realm in Bratislava, and how are you tackling those, let's say, three or four main challenges? Thank you very much. The first one is definitely the the relationship between uh, the mayor and and uh, everybody who who is working for Bratislava and a uh, citizen of Bratislava. There is a huge uh, lack, lack of trust. So when you say, I want to make a parking regulation, we are the last city in Europe without parking regulation, and I want to do it because it's important for Bratislava, for environment, public space, also for mobility in general, People always say, yeah, you, want our, you just want our money. And it's normal in every city, but the grade in a, which this uh, is happening in Bratislava is very high. So what I'm doing now, I'm traveling around neighborhoods in Bratislava and talking to people. Yesterday evening, I had three hours of meeting, which was more than 40 questions about just parking regulations. And this is what we are, what we are doing, and I like to uh, to, to meet with citizens of Bratislava. That's what I did for many years as an activist. Um, so, so this is the very important. Of course, the second thing is mobility. That's, that's the main thing. Uh, we will have the rise of, of uh, cars used in Bratislava is, is incredible. The data is saying that we are going to exploit in a few months or years. And uh, we are going to give a big push to, to public transport. I'm sure it's going to be war uh, it's going to work because p uh, people just just like it, but they need to have it uh, on time, very clean, very safe, and maybe every minute if it's possible. Uh, and the 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 third uh, very important thing I think is is uh, uh, to have. Um, there are so many, <laughs> but I can go with uh, trying to have a, from my point of view, is uh, trying to have a good relationship with uh, 17 neighborhoods. We have 17 neighborhoods with own mayors, own small city councils, and uh, there was always a fight between the city and the neighborhoods. And uh, what is important for me to have a good relationship because it's so much more we can accomplish when we when we when we call cooperating. And uh, that's that's very very 
big scope, but I'm definitely go would like to accomplish it. And that's something where everything else start. Uh, more green infrastructure, better public space, uh, the way how people can participate or on the future of the city. And maybe fourth, which is identity of Bratislava. If you imagine or if you understand identity as a, some kind of a uh, group of, uh, of properties, which you can uh, explain in one phrase or two phrases. Bratislava don't have nothing like that, you know? And it's because our city had a very liquid history. We had a big jams in, in what was happening in Bratislava because of Hungarian kingdom, Maria Theresia, communist era. Uh, imagine that Bratislava is the, there are only two capital cities in Europe uh, which changed their names in 20th century. The first one is Oslo, I would I remember, and the second one is Bratislava. So m maybe the main thing is to say, that, yeah, we would like to have Bratislava, this kind of city, in 20, 40, 50 years. And that's the very important, and we don't still have this idea. We have some ideas from Plan Bratislava, of course, and now we're working on the plan Bratislava 2030, but I stop here because it's becoming like my meeting with people in Bratislava, you know, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Are there any citizens of Bratislava here? Okay. Oh, okay. Bye. Okay, so so you can you can continue. You have um, I think ten people that live in Bratislava here. So it's a good meeting then. Um, so I have just learned we have time for one more question. You have another question? Okay. Can we get a microphone up here? Thank you. I would like to ask about Valtrovka. Have you been involved in the process of urbanism or from the beginning uh, that you could really influence how the structure is? Or uh, like, what do you, if you would describe uh, urbanism a little bit if you like it, or there are maybe some issues? Yeah, <laughs> this is a difficult question for landscape architect because you are always at the end in this process. So uh, we, did, we didn't really be involved, uh, or we were, but we couldn't really change anything. And uh, it's mainly because of the, of the topology of the project, because there is this part with this woodland you couldn't really change. And uh, there is this flat part at the bottom that uh, was suitable for, for designing buildings. So I don't think you could really change it. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's yeah. it. Because my experience is that I was working in Vienna, that we always involved uh, landscape architects from the beginning, that they could really be part of the team. I, I, and I think it's missing here, maybe, I don't know, has it in Bratislava? What, well, what do you think? Same. It's the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm always uh, trying to say to our investors or clients, that it's it's really important for them as well to, be, uh, to have the team on, on the beginning of the process, because uh, it's saving his money as well at the end. And uh, it's about uh, to uh, set up uh, some uh, some kind of idea of the project and uh, some plan and uh, it's much easier to to get it done to the to the reality when you have the team from the beginning the same you set your ideas and you can finish it uh, much easier till the end when the when the team is uh, set up and working together for I don't know uh, how long so just if you could add one one thing, which one issue which you would maybe change or which you would be critical about a quite successful project. Thank you. Oh, you mean Waltroka or? I don't know. Yeah, well, well, maybe, yeah, yeah, there was some <laughs> uh, funny thing is that we had uh, really much more stuff for recycling. But somehow, uh, in the process of construction, the, the things disappeared. We had a really nice, nice tree. A big tree which was there, waiting for for uh, it, I think it was it was meant to be a bench, and uh, this uh, this tree I don't know 20 meters high it just disappeared from a, from a night to morning, <laughs> and we had a couple more things like this which we uh, really had prepared for uh, to be used in the design but they somehow yeah disappeared so <laughs> but no i i'm really happy with this project because i think uh, this was the, the the good process that we started together with the team and uh, they really uh, finished it like we designed it so i'm happy <laughs>
Uh, good afternoon, guys. I hope you had a, a nice lunch. Um, uh, I'd really like to just start off by just saying a few quick thank yous. One uh, is to thank MMCT very much for putting on this event. I think it's a fantastic uh, event and it's really, you can see that so many people are enjoying it here today. I think that's fantastic. So thank you to MMCT. Um, second of all, I'd just like to thank uh, you guys for putting me up here with all of these other speakers who I think have been amazing today and um, they've been absolutely phenomenal and I think uh, I am absolutely humbled to be able to come up here and present our work alongside some of these really eminent you know uh, planners uh, architects uh, landscape architects and, and a mayor for God's sake so um, that's that's really humbling so I thank you guys very much and I'm also the warm-up act for David so that's that's also to be thanked right so um so get, let's get on with it, I guess. Um, so translucent boundaries, uh, the shifting uh, values of public realm design. Um, I, I'll go into that in a second, but uh, I, I'm from Insight, where planners and landscape architects were based in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and in Doha. And uh, we, we basically do a bit, a bit of work outside of that as well. But um, we are um, really striving to try and change the way that people view the landscape in the Middle East. And, and the translucent boundaries that we're talking about here are, are not just the, the, uh, the normal boundaries of, of you know, f uh, physical boundaries. We're talking about the kind of cultural, the heritage, the, the environmental, uh, those kind of boundaries that, that desi as designers, as international designers, and just as designers, we walk the line of those boundaries all the time. And they are constantly shifting and changing. And, and uh, that is, that is uh, very true, especially in the Middle East. So, you know, a lot of the time, it can feel a bit like this, uh, the design, design process. You're starting off, you're looking at all the different issues, and you're, you're, you're kind of coming up with these, uh, these, these things that are standing in your way. Uh, and it can seem like a very, very, very long road to, to get to where we want to go. But I think um, these kind of shifting, shifting boundaries of the, of the cultural context um, is something that in the Middle East, which is what, what, where we're based, uh, is, is happening more rapidly than anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of. Um, and, you know, I think this is what most people think of when they think of the Middle East. Um, they think of metropolises just springing out of the, the desert. You know, two million people, uh, a city for two million people built in, in five years. You know, this kind of thing. And, and you know, some of that is true. Um, but the things that, about the, the Middle East that people don't know is that there's uh, 51 million people in just the GCC region, uh, which is basically the Middle East. Um, and 49% of those are expats. They're not actually from there. So it's a huge cultural melting pot. Uh, and it has a lot of, uh, there's a lot of value to associated with that um, as, a, as a public realm designer. Um, it also has above average internet penetration, so there's a lot of there's saturation of internet, internet there. People are aware in the Middle East of what's going on throughout the world and what is good design. Um, and for instance, it's, it's a very, very young place. Uh, the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia for instance, 70% of the people who live there are under the age of 30. So you can imagine that this is a huge groundswell for change in the Middle East. But the thing that they do have is a really, really deep desire to be connected to their own heritage and to their own cultures. You know, um, sometimes designers are inclined to come in and project our own desires onto a place. And, and this is something that in, in the Middle East, um, they are uh, very sensitive to. And I think it's a key thing. Um, so before I go into this, I'll just explain a little. We kind of look at things in a few different ways. Uh, is, this is a very simplified version. Just excuse me one sec. So this is a very simplified version where there are two scenarios. Basically, there's the outside-in approach. The outside-in approach is what you think of when you think of the Middle East. Straight away, people would think of sand dunes. They'll think of, you know, oasis. Um, and that will be form the basis for their initial design concepts and that kind of stuff. Now, not to say that that is wrong, because actually, we do that as well. Um, and since we are based there, you know, we, we, try and, we try and have that as well. But sometimes, on their own, they're a little bit flimsy. And sometimes also, that application of uh, Western thinking, Western ideals, or, or out of the region thinking, can lead to, to master planning or to decisions that maybe aren't exactly suitable for the way people live 
in, in that region. Um, this is the Abu Dhabi um, master plan. It's, it's, it's a grid system, the blocks are huge, uh, and you also have, it was designed in 1974, um, and this is kind of the prevalent way of designing guess, in that stage, but it's highly, highly dominated by the car. So I'll come back to that a little bit later on, I'll show you an example of, of how we've dealt with something like that. The inside out approach is, is kind of where we try and lean towards. And we work with, as Jerry had mentioned, we, we've, uh, we potentially work with a bit, bit of work with Jerry. We've got other international designers who come and, and, and we work with them as well. But this is what we try and bring to the, bring to the equation, is the inside out approach that we are uh, able to kind of understand a little bit more about the culture because we are based there. As you can probably tell, I'm not from the Middle East. Um, that might be a surprise to some of you. But I'm actually from Dublin, I'm from Ireland, I've been there seven years. So I'm, I'm not from there. But what I do know is that I, I know from being there for a while that there is a sensitivity to these kind of cultural things. And this is a really, really good example, just this photograph alone. Um, so this is, the, the wall you see behind is the boundary wall to a house. In the Middle East, whole families will live in, in, within one compound, um, in a lot of places. And it's a very private place. It has a high wall around it. And in that, within that wall, um, people do their, their normal family stuff. Um, and outside of that wall is the, is the public realm. And how do they use it? Well, in the evening time when it's cool, the guys come out and sit on this bench um, and you know, talk to their neighbors, see people going by, um, you know, maybe smoke some shisha. This kind of thing. But this is a key thing that, that really the difference of how they, they use the public realm, how they use the spaces outside our house, and how, how sensitive they are to it. Um, it's also about these guys, you know? Um, what, what do these guys need? You know, what, what, there's a huge youthful generation there. There's going to obviously be a huge baby boom as well. If you compare it to the kind of aging populations that we have in Europe, you know, what, what do these guys need? They need more nature, they need more access to, to play spaces. They need more public open space to play in. So there's a huge opportunity there. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take you through a few examples of what we've done in the past and how we've used this kind of inside-out approach to uh, a blend of this kind of inside-out approach to, uh, to achieve what we hope is a, is a good solution for, for the, local, the local people there um, and for the, the expat community as well. So uh, there's a little slider here. Um, up here, it's like a, imagine it like a, a car engine, like a carburetor, it's like a fuel mix, we put a little bit of inside out in, we put a bit of outside, it, uh, uh, outside in, in and, we, and we blend it as is required for the different projects. So for this project, the ideal Emirati community, uh, we're doing a guideline for the local authority, and this is what we're dealing with, this is what they currently get. So in, in, uh, in the Emirates, it's a birthright. You get given a plot of land when you're born. Um, and you are entered into a lottery. And you, where that land is provided for you uh, is, is decided by the, the government in a lottery form. But what you can do is you can apply for groups of plots uh, for your family. So you can actually form your own sort of miniature little community with your family. But as you can see, you know, because every blot has to be the same because they need equity, because this is free for everybody, everyone has to get the same thing, you, you just end up with this huge grid format, format and it doesn't lend itself to a very, uh, a very friendly neighborhood. And you can see, like, kind of, we, we broke this one down uh, by looking at pre-oil uh, to post-oil, uh, and, or, or, you know, sort of now, nowadays. So you can see how things started off on the, right, the left-hand side, the courtyard house in the kind of pre-1960s, pre-oil. And then you can see um, what happened during nation building, and then the plots just got huge. You know, they just got incredibly massive as everyone's really rich with the oil. So like, I want a big house, so I want 10 bedrooms. So they made the plots huge. Uh, and now they've kind of come back to a, to a slightly smaller plot here on the, on the, on the right-hand side. So, but even in that plot, it's still sizable, it's still a six bedroom house, um, and it still has no interaction with the boundary wall, it has none of that stuff that, that this used to have, you know? So we looked at that in detail and we looked at what the uh, pre-oil situation, what we could learn about the pre-oil Emirati neighbor, neighborhoods. And it was really about the uh, urban density, you know, the, the orientation for passive, to reduce passive solar gains, to increase 
wind flow, um, and also like the porosity of the place, you know, wh where you can get more vegetation in, in between the plots, you can have more shade, you can get the plots closer together to create sikas or laneways, and they're kind of shaded more during the day. So it helps with the local climate. Um, and it, it really is this that kind of drove us towards what we, we started looking at next, which was the actual floor plan for the buildings. So this is the inside out approach. So how does that floor plan work? You know, we base these buildings around the courtyard. We try and push the space around the buildings out towards the boundaries. And so there's an interaction with the boundaries so we can create some kind of drama through the streets. We can also create a bit of interest. We can also create more shading. Um, and we looked at how people use that. And the really interesting thing when we looked at it was that when they live in families, the, the, the local population, they, um, like everybody in a family, they want to be close to their family, not too close. Uh, and they don't want to, uh, they, they can have, they don't want to have, a, you know, one gigantic plot with four houses on it. They want to have separate plots so they can close the door at night and go to bed and not be bothered by their, the rest of their family. But what we did notice as well, that once you started to, the top one is kind of an initial stage sketch, and the bottom one is a, is, a, is a later stage sketch, is that, you know, you could vary the, the, the orientations of these buildings, still the same size plot, but you start to get a lot of variation in the public realm that runs through in the orange in the back, and you start to get a lot more interest and a lot more opportunity then for, for, to make these places richer in terms of how they're designed. Um, and then if we apply that to a kind of local community, uh, over a kind of 150 meter walking distance, which is like a comfortable walking distance in, uh, in heat, uh, you start to realize that, you know, you put all your, your playground and your shops in that kind of distance. And this kind of forage basically just refers to a, a small community where you would have everything that you need. So we looked at different options and how we would group those together. And the kind of end result, and this is a very early stage and a very pixelated one at that, um, and we start just, you know, that starts to make a much more interesting master plan uh, and a much richer master plan than what we had looked at before. And you're still giving people equity. So another example is the, uh, is the gateway park. So this one's a little bit quicker. We'll try and keep it moving. Uh, the gateway park, this is located in Abu Dhabi. This uh, Abu Dhabi is essentially on an island, um, and the movement in Abu Dhabi used to go from the coast in the, in the winter to the oasis in the summer. And that's how people went back and forth across uh, the land. And this was a, f a fjord, basically, where the bridge is and where the tower is. It's where they used to fjord across into, onto Abu Dhabi. And so this is... Um, Basically, this is a very important site in terms of the, the heritage context of, the, of, of Abu Dhabi. So how we looked at it was, you know, in the context of what's there, there's the, the, uh, the, the Zaha Hadid bridges here, uh, the Sheikh Zayed bridge. You got the Grand Mosque, one of the most important religious buildings in the UAE, um, just nearby. You know, so we tried to orientate the site towards that. And essentially, what you have here is looking down this way, is towards the the Grand Mosque. And then we've created a, a big flexible lawn in the middle for events. We try to give this place back to the people who, uh, the community who use it, so that they could have community events there, whatever car shows is the kind of thing they're into, or if they want to have, um, you know, concerts, that kind of stuff. Um, and then with, we created these two mounds with viewing points on the top, but the mounds themselves were designed to tell the story and the, the history of the, of the location itself through its vegetation as well. So we looked at all the, the native and adaptive species. So it became like a botanical walk with a historical, uh, with a historical information along the way. And then we looked at how the viewing points from those mounds would work and how your story of how you walk along that, um, that route would, would work as well. And kind of the end result was this, and you can see the Zayed, or the, the um, Zaha Hadid bridge in the back was, was this. So, um, so that's where we got to. Unfortunately, the client, as is very common in the UAE, found out they didn't own the land. <laughs> and so that was, that was pretty good. Um, so this is another quick one as well, and this one's more leaning towards the kind of uh, functional, um, but also a bit of urban design in here because it's a, a pedestrianization study for downtown Abu Dhabi. So the photo I showed you earlier of the grid, you know, this is what it looks like on street level. And like, this is one of the junctions. You can see like just cars everywhere, small refuge areas. It's like, 
there's high containment curbs. Uh, there's a three by three with turning lanes. The average speed is probably about 80 kilometers an hour. Like this is downtown Abu Dhabi. And every street is the same. So what, what we wanted to look at, and we picked a study area, and this is just land uses, but we wanted to look at how, what, what you could do to improve that. And we decided that a one-way system would really benefit the, the city. So this is uh, the current situation. The, the office on the left is actually our Abu Dhabi office, so we know this place well. Um, and you can see the banality of the streetscape as well. You know, like it's just, there's nothing going on. There's no trees. There's this street furniture. I don't think MM City designed that one, I hope. Um, so there's, you know, there's nothing going on. It's so hot during the summer because there's no shade. You know, these, these materials that they've used are also fairly dark color, so they're, they're really, really captured the heat. Um, so what we looked at was, okay, what if we were to zone at the street um, and have a, a, on one side of the street, one way, on the other side of the street, have a bus rapid transit route or a, an LRT route, and what would be the effect on that in downtown Abu Dhabi? And the effect was, we saw it as being huge. Now this is where we took out the frontage lane as well, you know, took out all the parking, everything. This would be a huge, huge difference to downtown Abu Dhabi, creating an entirely new city center for, for the city, which doesn't really have one. And you would have lots of extra space for F&B against the frontages. You could get a dedicated two-way cycle track so people could s cycle safely. That could even be pretty well shaded with trees. And then you have your, your BRT and your, and your uh, LRT outside of that. So that's where we parked that. And unfortunately, the study went, went on and it's been currently tendered. So we're, we're bidding on it. Um, the next one is Saudi Cultural District. And this one is a little bit more towards the kind of okay, we have an idea, it's in this place. Um, how, how do we make it kind of contextually suitable? But, um, you know, the thing about this, this district, the Sadia Culture District, this is where the Louvre is, it's where the Guggenheim is, it's where the Zayed National Museum, so you've got a Norman Foster building, um, you've got uh, Jean Nouvel, and you've got, slip my head, my, Frank Gehry, thank you. Um, so, you know, the main thing for us with this was to, to not compete. We, you know, this is a streetscape that just links to the Louvre. We couldn't draw on the Louvre for, for our inspiration. So we looked around. This is Saudi Island. This is the island that's located on beautiful white sand beaches, you know, uh, fantastic, like mangroves. You know, this is like one side of Abu Dhabi. Um, so we drew on that and we looked at how potentially people would meander through the street, kind of like the currents, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we were kind of, we kind of were jamming on that for a while. And there's also like a, th a four meter level difference in the middle of it that was uh, forgotten about in the master plan. So we had to deal with that too. Um, so you can kind of see the, the level difference there. And this, this is kind of what we ended up with. So all the colors are kind of inspired by the local materials, but high, also high reflective ind index. What this is here is actually a provision for an LRT in the future, all the gravel on the right-hand side. So, um, and you can see the kind of level change here as well, where you've got this, this was like 15 meters wide and had to go up four meters. Oh, it's just absolutely nuts. That's a, the craziest stairs ramp you've ever seen in your life. Um, and it was also part of a, a cycle network as well. So you had to get bicycles up there. So the rest of this is all going to be built out in the future. So as it stands on its own, it looks a little bit out of place, but we, we designed it with the view that these, build, these plots beside it are going to be designed in. And some street furniture, we got some in. Um, the last project I'm going to show you guys, and I'm going to wrap up um, before we get too bored, is um, Dubai Hills Estate Park. Uh, this is, again, similar to the last one, kind of the outside-in approach. You can see the scale of this development here. It's being constructed out of the back of Dubai. The development is, is out to this line, goes all the way around. Our park is up there in the, in the, near to the, the, the main road, and uh, it's uh, mainly surrounded by apartments, uh, businesses, offices, hospitals, hotels, that kind of thing. So the challenge here was how do you provide a, a central park that provides for all of the needs of the people who are going to live there? And there will be other neighborhood parks built throughout the development in the villas to the right. But um, the, the whole park is about a kilometer and a half long. 
Um, the theme for this was actually kind of the, that journey that I talked about earlier from the oasis to the desert. You can see these kind of flowing forms, big wide open uh, uh, entertainment spaces and, and event spaces, and also like bespoke skate park. There's going to be swimming pools in there. There's going to be uh, like a pump trail. Like this is going to be really, really highly programmed because we're anticipating this could be a very, very popular development. And that's the shift. The shift has been in the time I've been there. And this, apologies for the quality of the photograph. Where this is still under construction. So in about six months' time, we're going to have a really big six months. There's going to be a lot of stuff designed, finishing. So unfortunately, my images don't look anything good as Jerry's. I don't know if they ever will. But anyway. Um, so yeah, so th but that's the shift that I've seen in, in, in the Middle East. And this time is that there's a shift towards quality public realm. Quality public realm that reflects you know, how they feel about the, their place. Um, and you can see just another shot there as well. And I think to wrap up, that's kind of, that's kind of the opportunity for us. It's, it's to be able to reflect that back in a way to bring some of our Western knowledge or our, our education to this area, to, to, to the Middle East, and, and, and uh, help to move these, these developments forward, but also to try and tie back in with their local culture. Um, and the, as I said, the shift is now that there's a huge desire for developers to have uh, to use landscape, like Jerry was saying, as a value, as a value add. You know, this is what they want to. They want to put the landscape out front. They want the renders like at the start, so they can start to show how amazing this place would be to live. So there wasn't that competition before uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, and now there is. So um, yeah, that that wraps it up. I'd like to thank you guys very much. I thanked everybody else. But I didn't thank you guys. Thanks very much for your time, and uh, I'm here if you need to ask me any questions. Thank you very much uh, for for stage and so on. Uh, thank you to everybody that you came. And uh, uh, this is uh, last presentation of today. So it means that uh, you are lucky because it's, the finish is very close. So, uh, but uh, I'm I'm uh, I think that the, the most important thing is to say that I'm not the architect. Unlike my uh, my colleague of, of speakers, I am industrial designers designer, and uh, uh, I would like to to add something from from our point of view, from point of view of uh, industrial design. We maybe I don't know why, but uh, we are really passionate in uh, public space, in design of public space, for more than 25 years. But our language is, is industrial design. We believe that uh, very well designed uh, products, like we hopefully do, uh, are very important for all of uh, creators of uh, public space uh, generally. So today I would like to present you the story of, uh, let's say, of, of two products. Uh, no, none of them are very, very new, but the opposite, uh, we, we uh, offer it for years. But I think that it's, that it's nice, uh, nice story uh, about how, how uh, products uh, are creating and uh, what, is, what is behind. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, both of products are benches. It means sitting elements. Uh, some something, some some piece for for si people sitting in a public space, but you can see that there can be a lot of uh, or very diverse styles of this completely same product, like the, the bench. Yes, you can see there are some pictures, some very random pictures, and you, you can see that you you can have a really completely different form for the same function. Uh, we work with, with this. Uh, uh, every day, yeah? we we offer in our catalog more than 15 uh, ranges of benches, uh, same function, same same purpose, but uh, different form. You can have something very light, like this. You can have something quite heavy, very very massive. It's like this. Uh, you, ca you can see that there are different materials like uh, wood and steel, but you can have also concrete and so on. 
So Woody is one of our product which we designed, I think now it's maybe exactly 10 years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more. And our intention was to have uh, something with a very natural look and uh, the inspiration came from this uh, timber. Yeah? Maybe all of you know this, this picture, know this experience that you are, you are passing uh, uh, around the, 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 this, this, uh, this uh, blocks of uh, timbers and this aesthetics is really marvelous. Yes, we like it. And we wanted to, to, to use this aesthetics for, for seating elements for public space. Uh, we wanted to, to use something very natural, natural with some, some uh, natural aging of wood. This is, this is very used and very, uh, very aged wood. And we want to have this, uh, this kind of look. So we started design. This is uh, some first sketches. Uh, how how to, to have very very heavy block of wood inspired by these this timbers and uh, we, which is which is which is uh, staying on, on some some uh, quite uh, quite light or or uh, not very massive uh, legs so and this is this is the, the the result of woody you can see that it's it's completely made of uh, of uh, timber or some some slats yeah, and we created a uh, very basic block of wood and we, we and th this is the, the result yes we, we play with this uh, with this wooden block and created uh, really a lot of forms or, or shapes of this basic uh, wooden wooden block yeah, you can see that there is triangle square also the straight line with, with uh, backrest or without backrest with a bicycle rack, so it's uh, it's very it's very universal form, which uh, which allows us to 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 prepare really nice uh, nice uh, units. So there are some some pictures of, of realizations, uh, also some details. You can see that we we, we could add tables or, and also other other uh, some technologies details like USB charging and so on, and. Uh, there, there are some some selected uh, projects where where it was used. This is in in Hungary, in Budapest. This is in France, Montevrian. This is very nice and very unique uh, unique uh, location because it's uh, it's on the terrace of uh, roadway on on Mont Blanc, the the, the highest point of Europe. Uh, this 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 terrace is uh, uh, three. 1,600 uh, meter above sea, which is a really extreme position for for benches. But it's a good example that even in this in these places, you can find uh, what what was designed in in our studio. This is uh, Košice in Slovakia. Uh, this is in in Colorado in in states. Uh, Prague this is Valtrovka uh, project, which we already saw, but this is the, the office part of, of this project. Uh, this is Austria, uh, another France, Dijon, very nice projects uh, along uh, uh, Canal. So, and we, we as, as I said, we designed this, 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 this bench, uh, we, we put it on catalog, and we have very good response and a lot of projects. Uh, from from beginning and it's 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 still it's still it's still going on, but uh, you could see that uh, the aesthetic of this of this block of wood is is very nice, but the problem is that there is a lot of wood. Yeah, it's it's very heavy and there is a big consumption of wood. Wood is very nice material, but also expensive material, and we want to 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 bring something, uh, let's say, with same uh, same look, same. Feeling, but uh, with, with with much less of wood, and it was time for block. Less wood, similar typology, and this this was the the, the basic uh, brief. Yes, to have almost same, but uh, with only let's say uh, minor minor of consumption of wood. You can see that if you do it like this, it's, it's ridiculous, it's, it's absurd, and it doesn't work. So, then we 
started to to to, to design how to do it, how how to how to bring the same look, the same massive uh, massive. Uh, uh, atmosphere, let's say, or massive uh, product, but uh, with uh, with uh, different uh, or much much smaller consumption of wood. Uh, this is some some playing of of uh, of look. Of, of, uh, this is what we what we felt. We wanted to have some 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 big heavy body uh, sitting or standing on on very light. Uh, light uh, spikes or something like this it was it was our idea in our heads and and we 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 wanted to 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 solve it to have this uh, this final solution there are some some very diverse uh, sketches or solutions you can see how we how we play with with this uh, with this let's say empty space inside uh, but uh, with different different design and uh, this is the final. Yeah? This is the final. This is final design of block. This uh, design is maybe six, maybe seven years old. It's also nothing very new, but uh, but still very very successful and very very used in many projects. And you can see that uh, the wood, the construction of wood, is co wood is completely different. Yeah? So this is this is the result. Yes, we have uh, I don't know one third of, of wood or maybe less, uh, and yeah, this this is the comparison. And uh, the, the 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 look or, or the, the the design or the, the product looks like this, and it means that the look is very very similar. Yeah? Also many versions like. Uh, uh, single seats. We have also picnic uh, picnic table or set, uh, set uh, sitting uh, benches and table. Uh, also a version with uh, with uh, with table with backrest. There are some details. You can see that it looks like very very simple simple rectangular bench, but uh, there are so many very very nice and very fine details which 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 is necessary to to get a really advanced design. So and even block is is very very successful and you can find it in many projects, like here in Tampa in Florida, Prague. Uh, this is in Berkeley in University, very nice place, very crowded place. It's almost impossible to to take this picture without people almost. Uh, this is Caribic, it's a part of European Union in Western Hemisphere, and uh, this is Moscow. Uh, Hoboken, opposite of, of Manhattan, city, city opposite of Manhattan. Uh, also Dubai, definitely. And uh, Poland, Sweden. This is Brazil, Sao Paulo. So uh, it means that uh, even block is, is a very, very important product for us, a very, very wide range. A lot of lot of uh, lot of uh, versions, but uh, the, the story uh, uh, doesn't end. Yeah, we have uh, the process is never ending, and that's why we have uh, we have, for example, this version, which is not made of wood, despite we design it for for uh, for having a, a product with uh, with less consumption of wood. This is not from wood; it's made of. Uh, of resista, which is a composite material from waste, and uh, it looks like uh, like uh, the original one, but uh, because of a completely different material, because of this profile, which is made of uh, recycled material, uh, we had to we had to make many changes. It means that oh, even even uh, even dimensions are not same. We had to adapt it, but the look is like this. Also, this version with, uh, with photovoltaic panels uh, and uh, uh, USB charging, also uh, wireless charging, and you can see that the the design is yes, you can, there is how how it works inside. There are accumulators and so on. We can use the empty space inside. Uh, this this is the the special special uh, benefit of this design. 
uh, it looks like this. Yes, yeah? so you you can you can see that it it goes very well um, uh, together with with uh, with furniture without photovoltaic panels. And uh, but even Woody, which was the, on, on the beginning, is is the, the, there is no in the end of the life. But we have some other other uh, versions, other other solutions. This is with photovoltaic panels as well, with different different uh, uh, different uh, shapes. So uh, it means that now we have. It, it's uh, we, have, we have both uh, both products in catalog still. Both are very popular. Both uh, has a lot of uh, projects. Both are very well accepted by by architects. So it's uh, it was very it's it's very nice story about how we how we work and how we how we try to solve uh, uh, products. Uh, how we solve uh, uh, problems. Let's say like punch. So. <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is this is it. Thank you. It looks like it. Oh, okay. Hi, it's Martin from Cracknell, Dubai. Um, in terms of materiality for the furniture, um, we love the wood. Clients don't. Um, are you planning on new innovations, new material to um, study? for climates like ours? Uh, you know, we, we do it uh, uh, every day. <laughs> we, we try to find some alternative uh, of wood uh, for years. Yeah? But it's true that the wood is, is still one of, if, if not bad, best, one of the best. Yeah? And uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we like, Wood because of comfort, but I think what is very important is aging, because every material aged, but uh, but uh, wood is uh, is aging uh, beautifully or or nicely. So it means that wood is. I think that wood uh, would be, remain for for forever. Uh, the question is uh, kind of wood we use. Uh, Mostly tropical wood because of uh, the best uh, best uh, uh, characteristic, but uh, we definitely have some alternative like uh, like acacia, which is European. We have also now we, we are testing thermo wood, so it means that we we be, the, the the wood is a big issue in our company from from beginning, and it, it will be. Regarding uh, alternatives, we have this resista, which is which is composite material made of uh, partially made of uh, made of uh, uh, waste or rice husks. Uh, but we have also HPL material, which is uh, which is a very nice material with with possibility of uh, of using some graphics on on surface. So and we use also steel. Yeah. And we have also uh, benches with, with concrete seating, seating flat. So this is this is this is some alternative which we have, and we are we are trying to, to find some some new solutions, but uh, it's quite difficult because because of very demanding uh, conditions where we have to where, where we have to use it. Yeah. Uh, hello, I have a question for Rowan regarding the sustainability. Mm -hmm. I saw in your last two projects that uh, there is a lot of uh, land with loan in desert. So my question is, uh, is this a trend? Because I guess this is really hard to maintain in terms of money. Can you yeah. give us some... Yeah, look, I think what you see there is a, a particular project where the client doesn't uh, has understood the value of having some lawns in a dense development. Is it used everywhere in, in all of our designs? No. Um, the, the, the design that you saw for the Sadiat street, the streetscapes, the Louvre, uh, that uses like two liters, two, two liters per square meter per day, which is very, very, very low. Like, and in terms of sustainability, um, you know, it is, it is a really hot topic in the Middle East. Really hot, literally 
a hot topic because they're at the co they're not the cold face they're at the hot face so they, they are actually really pushing they have their own similar lead to lead system in Abu Dhabi called Asadama which uh, states that you have to use low water use you have to use native adaptive species and um, you have to have irrigation controllers of a certain standard this kind of thing so I mean to answer your question lawns we use them where we think we can, where we think it's worthwhile, it's worth the value, it's worth the water. But you know, you look at the palm trees are the same thing. They use a ton of water. So you look at something and you see the palm trees everywhere, like you could take out, take out a few palm trees and you might be able to have a lawn. So uh, it's, it's a balance, it's a real balance. But no, to answer your question, sustainability is very, very high on the agenda and water use is obviously very high on the agenda. And lastly, the water that they use is also usually treated sewage effluent. So it's actually water that would otherwise be waste. So um, that's how they, they treat things normally in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Thank you, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, is it hard in such a climate to get pedestrians or people out to the outside space? Because I thought that they travel mainly by car because of the climate, that you had this range of 500 meters. Yeah, yeah so look, like, uh, Absolutely, like the car is the big, getting people out of cars is the biggest challenge. Um, and the fact that the design of a lot of the streetscapes hasn't taken account of shading in a lot of situations makes a huge difference. And I, ha I have a graphic I'd love to show you someday, the difference in temperature between downtown Abu Dhabi and Mazdar, where there's a lot of shading, a lot of buildings shading, is like something on a hottest day of the year can be like 15 degrees because there's that much more shading. In a, compared a completely open street with hard materials, dark materials, to somewhere with very light materials with a lot more shading. So, I mean, that's a huge difference. So getting people out is difficult, but also culturally the way the, the public realm works is more towards the, in the summer, is more towards the nighttime. And so people come out and use the public realm at night because it's a lot cooler and still really hot. But uh, yeah, during the day, that is a big issue. And I, and I think the, the dominance of the car is the biggest thing that they have to overcome. But they also haven't, and we spoke about this a lot last night, they haven't designed their cities particularly smart. You know, they've designed, well, they've designed their cities very quickly and they've designed them with the kind of current technology as best they could. And, and the result is these really car-dominated cities. Uh, and that's just a stumbling block on every, uh, from every point of view. So uh, it's, it's a huge, huge challenge. And I think the next, I mentioned Saudi Arabia very briefly there, but that's the kind of new front. And I, I mean, politically, it's a very sensitive situation, obviously, but I mean, that's the new, that's the new front where they're, they're having the opportunity to look at the other countries who've developed cities quickly and what mistakes they've made. And I think that's probably where you'll see a lot more of the, the kind of dominance of the car being, being addressed. Uh, at, at a kind of master planning level. Um, but it is a, yeah, a serious challenge. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question all the way there in the back. If you come down the central aisle. Um, Last but not, not least, uh, I have to say thank you to David and his team uh, for this opportunity to, to be here today. And I have to say that they do a great job it's amazing opportunity and it's amazing project. And I, I know MM Sita for, I would say, maybe 15 years. And I see they made a big, not big, they made a huge step or jump and progress. And they have great products, excellent marketing, excellent design. And I think the future is very bright for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice question, thank you. <laughs> Is it the uh, Slyovitz homemade? Of course, it is. <laughs> so, uh, I think that uh, there, from now there will be a lot of time to, to have, uh, let's say, a spontaneous discussion between all of us, I, I believe, and uh, and I think that it's, uh, yeah, I, we, we, we have a lot of space to, to, to questions and answer.